how do we embrace that? Because he can't kick that high. You're right. This character is right for this character. And there's one where Ron does a spin kick and he falls. Like, you know, I think he was finding Andy in the, in the pool and he does a spin kick and he falls. Like, that was a real fall. Like, <laughs> he just got back up again. And that wasn't like the choreography per se, but we're like, that's what you want. Like, let's just do that. That's a print. I remember um, that. I remember that going like, that was real. <laughs> But I want, to right. that, I want to believe that he made that one up. So yeah. <laughs> I know, I know. This is an interview with Bao Tran. Bao is a director best known for his recent hit action comedy, The Paper Tigers. We talk about Hong Kong cinema, indie filmmaking, and comedy. What's up? Good morning. Good afternoon. Ooh, Happy Christmas. Happy holidays. Thanks, man. I think we've been pretty nonstop after we last saw each other in San Diego. We went to Japan and then I had to go do some, uh, I'm on, on this TV directing program. So I was doing some shadows. So I was in Vancouver and Montreal and oh. now back home in Seattle. So, so I was on CW Kung Fu. I've never Shift. seen it. Uh, I heard of it. Yeah. Good team. Good crew. Uh, but yeah, the, it's like a lot of these type of productions that are getting the TV directors trying to get new blood and stuff. So yeah. You're trying to bring up new directors underneath you? Is no, they're trying to bring me in. To they're trying to bring TV. you in? Yes. Yeah. Wow. So, so they want to show like the ropes of TV directing. Because I don't know if you've done oh, TV, okay. but it's like it's such a different beast, man. It's like, it's just, it's very, it's like more, more the writer driven versus director driven. So it's a whole nother uh, kind of workflow that you have to kind of work around, work that's with. Like, that's yeah. like uh, video games are more writer driven as well. Um, yeah. Do you think that you could pull off what you want to do? I mean, we're starting like, well, I guess we're going to work backwards now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah do, you, do, you, do you think that TV is something where you can actually execute what you want to execute? And I don't even know quite what you want to execute. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, I think, like I said, it's the right, it's the showrunner medium. So you're basically coming in as a hired gun if you're going as a guest director uh, to basically help them execute their vision. If if I have a show that I'm creating, yeah, I think it's a kind of a different conversation. So it all depends on how you kind of get in. Same thing with on the feature side, if you do a studio film or do an independent film, those are all kind of like different factors about how how the creative is driven, yeah. Did this come after, I mean, has it been in, in the process for a while or is it because of Paper Tigers? It came from after Paper Tigers, yeah. I think there was, uh, you know, all these programs are popping up to kind of support emerging filmmakers or in their eyes who are emerging or diverse filmmakers. So <laughs> it's just kind of like, an opportunity also to explore that world which is crazy again it's like tv is like i guess tv is like a misnomer because really it's like episodic series and storytelling that's kind of like the new the new model i think right whatever for worse things are shifting towards you know more long form like uh the tv model yeah it's obviously that's the streaming model seems yeah. like that's and even for i mean i would assume that it's also like the feature film model for streaming as well it's probably pretty close i don't know i mean i think it's like the other thing is if you, the tv series that are on streaming they don't have like hard act breaks you know they don't have those commercial cut to commercials so those are kind of a different format stuff like that because you did a web series for you did wasn't that mortal kombat that was a whole kind of series but it didn't have like breaks for commercials right it just kind of like told through the stories yeah we're in a strange uh -huh. new world, my friend. And when I stepped outside, I didn't recognize it. I know, man. And I was get, I was just getting used to, you know, 720p. I know, geez. <laughs> <laughs> Remember that? Yeah, like, yeah, I mean, not not only like the standards that keep changing, you know, um, production-wise, but then I guess pipeline-wise and distribution-wise just keeps changing every, every year, it seems. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we can start back at the beginning. But like one of the examples that I uh, pull is that, you know, I'm an American dude that was raised on, you know, B horror films and vaudeville. And then I discovered Jackie Chan and wanted to kind of do that style and how like there's kind of like a communication bridge, <laughs> right? There's a gap that you have to cross. And uh, I'm curious uh, where you got your start and, you know, how what you were raised on what you watched as a kid and where you grew up if you want to start there man i'd love to know more yeah i mean it's there's a lot of things to unpack especially talking about two cultures or even just movie cultures and genres and stuff like that that's a huge part uh i grew up in 
a small town, not a small town, but called Olympia, Washington is the capital state or capital city of Washington state. Uh, my family came here after the Vietnam War in the late 70s. They were part of kind of the boat people exodus, which is kind of a touch point, you know, for a lot of my memories and my experiences out of that because you're escaping this country and coming to this new world. Um, and I was born actually after. So I was like the the golden child, you know, they really came to America to give birth to me. That was that was really just all, all their lives led to my <laughs> my birth, um, much like Christmas, I like to say. Um, but uh, and then that was kind of like the thing where I was the only person of my generation, my cousins, you know, that was born here in the States. So it was kind of a different experience, even though my my siblings and my brother and sister you know, uh, came early and they were able to speak English, but, you know, it's always, always a little bit of a separator that, you know, I was born in the, in the United States from that. Um, but, you know, growing up was a huge, uh, huge, uh, I guess you could say almost a search for the old world or a search for culture, a search for, you know, kind of retaining these things. And I, I mentioned, you know, I went to Vietnamese school, like my, my parents, you know, our community, and Olympia built us, uh, you know, a community and school for kids to learn Vietnamese and study reading, writing and all that stuff to keep the language. Um, so that was like all the kind of the formal events and also the music uh, kind of cultural events. But also at home, you know, they would go and find movies and TV shows and, you know, go to the mom and pop video stores or whatever Chinatown uh, video shops that were around back, that, back then. We were talking about VHS tape, VHS tape rentals and watching you know, movies and TV from Asia that were still being produced and being sent over and they were dubbed in Vietnamese and all these different versions. And so it was like kind of like that weird uh, thing at home. I'm watching uh, Asian stuff uh, and eating Asian food and then going to school, you're eating hamburgers and pizza and watching American films, blockbuster, you know, temple uh Spielberg and your Camerons and all that stuff, which is all great. So then I kind of got a jumble of all these different uh, forms of entertainment, language, cultures, sense of humor, especially those are all kind of like huge uh, things. I, I didn't really put into words what it was, but I could tell these were kind of different. But why is this funny? And also this funny as well at the same time. But they're almost working on different planes, if it makes sense. Your parents really weren't. They weren't trying to hide the Vietnamese culture you were they were trying to get yeah. you up to speed so okay okay yeah it was a way to like keep me from being like too um, uh, whitewashed or white you know losing the culture so anything that was like i could watch that was that was vietnamese or asian related you know it was very welcome they watched it and they wanted to see because also reminded them of the old world you know whatever you know the reminiscence and nostalgia and all those things um so there's all these kind of like forms of entertainment like in Viet in vietnamese american culture there's this thing called paris by night which is like these kind of vaudeville review shows of music and and comedy sketches and all those things and these were all in Vietnamese and they were filmed and uh distributed over videotape and stuff like that so these are all kind of like things that were happening almost in a way that unconsciously just a way um to kind of remember you know your culture but Vietnamese people are very uh what's the word very sentimental. It's a very strongly dramatic, melodramatic culture, you know, so all those those type of things are are, are appreciated versus, you know, in the States where or Western culture, things are like more muted and more subtle. So these are kind of like interesting things that, again, I couldn't put into words. But now looking back, you kind of realize like how different these diets were. And I use that word intentionally, you know, diets, because it's also spread across the food and culture and, and your entertainment, all those things were what we were taking in. Can you talk about what the old world was for your for your parents? <laughs> I would love to know more, man. Old world was war, right? I mean, it really, if you think about the French oppression, you know, dating back to the 1800s, even to the fight for independence, you know, in the 40s, and then now you have this massive civil war or whatever you might call it, this this war that was going from, from the 50s to the 70s to the time my parents had left. You know, my parents basically just knew war and, war and famine. And so that's like... A trauma that you know is weird when you start to really speak it out because you were like wow that's like basically what they knew since birth uh but it was such a common thing talked about and maybe i don't know maybe depression era kids or kids of depression era parents kind of relate to that because it's just such a thing that's always talked about people starving people dying like we talked about all these things around the dinner table all the time like these are very much embedded in our view and yet there's also a fierce pride of our culture, our identity, and and who we are, and you know uh, yeah. what we can represent, 
you know, especially now in 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 this new world of the United States, how to how to show who we are and how we can basically show ourselves to be just as American as anyone else. So those are all, all really interesting, almost like this fighter spirit um, that is very much like this poet warrior spirit. I thought was really interesting. Now looking back, all those things. I, of course, as a kid, I didn't, I wouldn't put these into words as much. But your parents did put them into words. They weren't hiding these things. <laughs> you all about it. I mean, was that part? Is that the sentimentality that you're talking about? Because when I talked to my grandma about the Great Depression back when she was alive, um, yeah. she just didn't really want to talk about. It. Almost like she wanted to forget. Yeah, I, I'm not quite sure what it was. What was that like for your parents and yeah. communicating with you and your siblings? Yeah, and I'm sure that's. I'm not. I don't know if I'm the the major case i'm sure other people have different experience with their families as well but you know for us it was a, a way of remembering and you know if you stop talking about it you forget it and it doesn't become a present thing anymore and and it shapes who you are it shapes you know your grittiness your your also being in gratitude for who you know what the, all the things that you can have in your life now uh despite all that you know all those things were really important for my parents to be able to imbue you know to the kids and to the, the next generation and be able to pay it forward and grow and, and, and build off of that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that, that, there's the other thing also emotionally, Asians have an emotionally distanced thing where we don't say I love you, but we show it in different ways, you know, making sure you've eaten or making sure you're taken care of. And so the love language is always, uh, always a little bit different from, you know, maybe what we might say now in the modern day, but I, those are all kind of like bundled into that. And so I, I think really talking about the things that have happened in the past, isn't uh what was me but it's a form of maybe you can think of it as an act of love because they're trying to share things that they went through and and so that you can appreciate and learn from that did that stuff scare you when you were a kid when <laughs> uh not though i mean you hear like ghost stories you know because i think you know vietnamese culture and war and death and just stories of people all those things the, you know i've heard a lot of ghost stories growing up those are kind of the creepy ones as well so again like the spirit world and the world we're here now like all this stuff growing up is very much present and real and so that's uh that's a way of looking at the world as well right is there some overlap there with chinese culture and are there are there other aspects that vietnamese culture and i understand vietnamese culture is not you know monolithic like there's a lot yeah. of different a lot of different parts of it but where you where your parents were from is there a lot of overlap with chinese culture uh yeah, I mean, all of that. I mean, it's overlap with French culture or Chinese culture. You know, it's a country that's been subjugated, but also subjugated other countries. So it's a, like this mishmash of 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 who they are. Um, yeah, all the things, all the things. I think there's, you know, the threat of Confucianism runs strong, you know, among all Asian countries or any kind of like uh, within that geographical realm. So the idea of like honoring your parents and then your family and all those things are really uh really treasured and valued and obviously you know they they come to a head or clash when you're growing up in a culture such as uh in western culture in the united states or something like that those are all all those different like flashpoints uh that you know i had to learn to navigate and still continue to navigate you know i always wondered um because the confucianism you know it was a lot of the time used by imperial rulers like the like the Qing, for example, they use Confucianism to say, well, because we have the mandate, therefore you have to, because they were, you know, they were imperial invaders from the north. Um, is that something that in, in Vietnam were, were people trying to square that with the imperialists, you know, France, America, whatever it was? Like, what is that? Is that is that a tension within Vietnamese culture? Um, I'm not sure if I'm getting the question right, but I mean, I'll, I'll riff on it, but yeah. it's like, I think it's like there's a fierce sense of your homeland and your your who who you are, and that's the Confucianism that you draw on. And whether it's like strongly Vietnamese or and any temp sense of fighting for independence or fighting against the oppressors is is very much uh, a strand a strand of that. And so the Confucianism, how that feeds into it is, is that you are you know defending your family, you're honoring your mother your motherland and all that stuff. That that's how it feeds into if we're talking about war and any type of invasions and stuff like that. I mean all these stories of these heroes that you kind of grew up with are like all these stories of people who were were fighting against the Chinese uh, invaders and eventually they got crushed. <laughs> it's like, it's all like a martyrs type of story. Like eventually it's an underdog story, right? Because they know just China is just such a behemoth 
And so historically, it's always been kind of the stories of like, almost like, you know, your William Wallace's and, and stuff like that, just these tragic stories of heroes, but they're heroes nonetheless. And that's, that's a huge thread of, I think, also Confucianism as well, not just kind of using it as an oppressor's tool, right? Right, right. that makes sense. Talk about your uh, introduction to Hong Kong cinema. Love to hear uh, what that was like for you. Yeah, I mean, like I said, we were watching, you know, TV shows and movies from 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 Asia, but also, you know, Bruce Lee was being uh, broadcast. His movies were, you know, on, on television, there was like uh, Black Belt Theater and Kung Fu, you know, all these kind of like these, these Kung Fu uh, programs that were on cable TV. I don't know if the kids remember, but you and I remember it, <laughs> but, you know, but it was just like regular, that was another regular kind of program, but also these were like English dubs or English versions. So it was kind of like this weird, like, I didn't understand what was happening. Like, I didn't, like, I didn't understand why I guess I never questioned why these were English dubs and I was watching Vietnamese dubs and all those things. So it's like, it's kind of like a interesting thing uh, to think about now, but it was just all like, Oh, Asian faces, Asian people, Asian stories. Like these are all kind of period stories. A lot of the Kung Fu movies were, were period stories. And I, that was all just kind of a way of accessing into, you know, a history that I didn't know, or I didn't even access. So you look at the geography and it's a, it's a whole, topography that you don't even recognize which is asia right and so there those are all those are all things bruce lee was kind of the touch point because i knew he was had some type of american roots and maybe yeah with inner the dragon it was in english and it felt like it wasn't you know, like an american show and you know green hornet some of the reruns so you always felt like oh he was like an asian american versus like this this kind of distant you know uh figure and so that was like something that I really, he was someone that I really watched and appreciated and enjoyed. Uh, but I have to say, it wasn't really like as a, like, oh, I want to make movies. Like he was just such a star and he was just such a charismatic figure as far as like who he was and the hero that he kind of presented. Uh, and then you kind of just sat and admired him just like you would admire a statue or something like that. And it wasn't until I started seeing Jackie Chan movies that, uh, I can't really call how it was coming. It, it could have been through Blockbuster even because they were distributing some of his videos, uh, films at that time as well. They're the newer ones. But I started seeing Jackie Chan and I really started feeling the filmmaking. And I think you can appreciate it. It's like there's some rhythm and there's some feeling around the cuts and the sound effects and the fighting and the action. There was just something that was really tactile and, and visceral. And it felt like, wow, there's something to something behind the camera. Like, I think that was almost this, this wake awakening moment when you realize that someone is actually shooting this, someone actually is cutting it and creating it versus like, here's Bruce Lee, you know, as a presentation, that's Bruce Lee. Right. And really understanding like, Oh, there's something else beyond that. So I couldn't, again, I couldn't quite really figure that out, but I felt it. Um, I want to say it was maybe even as a roundabout way in a weird way, I was watching some interviews that he was doing, Jackie Chan was doing, and he was talking about his influences were like Gene Kelly and Buster Keaton, Charlie Chaplin and Fred Astaire. And it's like, I didn't know any, I heard these names before, but I didn't know who they were. And I started kind of digging further. I wanted to kind of explore who these, who these people were. And these were not action people, right? And these are musicals in silence. It's almost like a kind of far cry from what you would think is action movies. And I started watching that and I really started appreciating what that meant, what that kind of like link of inspiration was. And that kind of led me down just loving movies, starting to really fall in love with movies, you know, filmmaking and filmmakers and all those things and all that stuff. And, then, and that was kind of like really what opened the door, I think, for Jackie Chan was for me that. Do you think that Jackie's style then is a is kind of it's almost against what Bruce and kind of like the. <laughs> What would you like the action here? It's almost like an anti-action hero in a sense, because it's a, it, you think that his focus and maybe the reason that you were attracted to it's probably the same reason I'm attracted to it is that, it, like you said, it revealed the human behind it, but it kind of like broke down the mythology of the character. Yeah. And is there something about that that's, that's appealing to you? Yeah. I mean, all the above. I think what Jackie kind of presented was, yeah, a guy who was vulnerable and he'd said it himself, like when Bruce Lee kick high, I kick low, you know, Bruce Lee punches, I, you know, I punch and then I hurt my hand. Right. So all those things that he was intentionally doing, you know, that definitely came across the screen because you could relate to him. You could see him, you could struggle with him. You And so I think that's kind of like, if we're going to pop open the veil a bit and you know that's really what storytelling and filmmaking is it's like an empathy they call it these empathy machines right now this is kind of a 
a weird hipster term, but you know, empathy machines, right? And so these are kind of ways for us to kind of access these characters and stories, but also see ourselves in them. And I think that's what, you know, through the action genre is what he kind of unlocked is that vulnerability. And, uh, you know, Bruce Lee's this Adonis and like, the you know, again, those are, that's a form of storytelling, but something about Jackie just really sparked uh, the possibilities in me of what a movie is and can be. And really that's just kind of like, yeah, that's how I kind of really kind of came through it. Action, martial arts, silent movies, musicals, right? And so this whole kind of like, if we're talking about different mixture of cultures, like when you start getting into serious film study, you know, there's a canon, there's things that are like highbrow and sophisticated and acceptable. And then like action stuff, or, or at least at that time, you know, action stuff or anything like you say, B movies were, were kind of like frowned upon because these were not filmmaking. These were just not like, you know, and so I never felt that divide. I always loved the stuff that I grew up on. And I thought saw that there was a lot of value in it. And so why is that making me feel something in the same way that's making an audience feel something? It's making a lot of money. So something's happening, right? So it's like, so I never kind of subscribed to that, I guess that film snobbery, but you know, there for the longest time, maybe now uh, folks or people these days don't necessarily appreciate it. Maybe it's still there, but like action and, and, and any type of genre stuff was really looked down upon. And it wasn't really considered like, you know, art. Yeah, you could probably say the same of like spaghetti westerns, probably yeah. treated the same way in the 60s. Yeah. You know, who wasn't influenced by spaghetti westerns, right? And I don't know, there's probably there's probably an element too of you know, that kind of film snobbery, uh, where yeah, there 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 is something that's kind of like difficult about doing a simple action film. It can actually be very difficult to do yeah. that. And sometimes it's easier to bloviate and overcomplicate things. And that's what film professors sometimes are really good at. Uh, and that's why they're we're film- good at that too. We're, we're yeah, pretty- yeah, of course. Yeah. We'll look at that right now. Uh, but- What's even the divide between, you know, say, you know, all these like lines and divides are artificial as, you know, I'm sure you appreciate, but, you know, say dra- drama and comedy, right. You know, comedy is really difficult to do, but because it comes across as easy or simple, like I think people miss the sophistication behind it. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's a whole. That's a whole can of worms. <laughs> that's a whole nother topic. Yep. Yeah. I want to hear about what made you pick up a camera the first time. Uh, Jackie Chan. I mean, yeah. You, you start then when I saw there was a man behind the machine. You're like, oh, maybe I could be that man behind the machine, right? And you start pick up a camera. Really, it was just like grabbing my dad's camera. But you know, I I played I fussed around with with gears and toys and stuff like that and cameras and you're playing around with like. You know, you're filming, you're connecting to TV and you're filming into the TV. All this, like, you're just dinking around with it. But actually to intentionally, like, create a story or do something, that was, like, really came off of Jackie Chan and try to figure out how, like, how a fight scene is put together or even just, like, even just a mundane cut. How do you even do a cut, especially with the gear that I had, which was, like, VCRs and stuff like that. And you start just to kind of, like, understand it from a mechanical point of view um grabbing your friends obviously just trying to script a story or even just a stupid sketch and usually those were all oneers because you didn't know how to cut right you just had like you just whip pans and you're just like doing it all like a long long sketch one or uh but stuff like that is like you you know you really start to understand what it means to stand behind a camera and hold it and actually not just capture a moment like at that time you know you film birthday videos and you know all those things but actually creating a moment and being in the right place for it and that's like the you start to futz around and in, 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 in the dark about that and start to learn about what that actually is. Because really at the end of the day, that's what, you know, your square, your rectangle, what goes into that is, is what we do. So did you have to edit between VCRs or like, what was the process before you could do your first edit? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think you did an end camera. So you either like do your end point, either that's the take you get, or like, you know, that's, that's it. That's the, that's the take. And then you cut and then you pick it up on the next go around and then, you know, next shot and you do that. And then you start to realize, oh, wait, so if I use the connect and you get the right cables, you can, I'm not sure even uh, I knew how to, I don't know, like, you know, you asked me, like, I don't even know how I figured it out. I guess I just kind of understood the cables and you read the ins and outs and like, uh, oh, this is buttons record. Like I, there was no, I don't think I ever read through a manual, but you know, you had the RCA cables. So you just kind of follow the cutter color coding and then figure out how to like put it together. But then you're like, oh, this goes to this. Oh, you know what? It's because we dubbed a lot of movies. <laughs> I remember that. So we re- we recorded, you know, we borrowed a lot of movies from the video stores, which were bootlegs to begin with. Let's let's establish this. And then we dubbed it so that we could have our home copies or we'd make copies for it. That's how I learned. Yeah. 
So you learn how to like at least duplicate. And then now from that point, you can figure out how to how to make cuts. Are you saying dub? You mean you made a copy? Is what you're saying? Yes. Yes, yes. For you the didn't kids. know Vietnamese dub over these. Oh, correct. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, what would be yeah, duplicate. It'd be yeah. <laughs> okay, so you figured out how to edit on VHS. Was there a moment when it clicked for you that you could make a moment using editing? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was this dumbest gag, but it was just like someone at the top of the stairs is going to jump. You know, he jumps off the top of the stairs and I just cut to the bottom of the stairs and him landing. And it was done like comedically. I already knew it was like funny, but it was just funny. It was an interesting cut because it was like it, it works like and it's still funny to me because I, I'll watch an edit and I'm still like surprised when a cut works. Like, it's like really like, it's a little like little blip and a little bit of excitement, but it's amazing. Just a guy going through a door, a woman, you know, opening a car door and sitting in, and then suddenly you're inside the car. Like, yeah, that's magic. That it's like, I, I don't, I don't care how experienced or how jaded, you know, I'll, I'll ever get, but like there, when you make that work, you're like, wow, it's like, there's just a really powerful thing. So I start learning, start learning and appreciate that the cut is the thing. It's not just the shot. The shot is important, but it's also the cut that makes it. Yeah. It took, took filmmakers a long time to figure out the cut. Um, 100%. Just like, it, it, it doesn't make sense if you think about it. Like, well, you can't, you're, let's say you're Edison. Like, well, we can't put two films together. People won't know what they're looking at anymore. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but there's this amazing ability that we have where we can blink our, it's almost like we can blink our eyes and we see, you know, cause effect, right? And we put the two yeah. together. We just, we can just bridge it. In, yeah. our, in our minds without even seeing the the stuff in between necessarily there's nothing in the real world that is that you know what i mean there's nothing in the world that replicates a cut you know we have i mean maybe to... maybe waking up on the other side of your house with uh with like a bottle of whiskey on the oh, ground over, yeah but, yeah but like yeah. otherwise yeah it's kind of hard to find that huh? but no now that being said i think dreams are closest to that dreams are closest to cuts because you move and you're suddenly here now you're suddenly there now and you're going to all these places and you just go with it and maybe that's really the subconscious thing of it all. And that's I wish how someone, I wish someone was better at editing that stuff, though, man. It never makes sense. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I can't make heads or tails of my dreams. Why don't you? Do <laughs> I don't even remember my dreams anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Time. <laughs> you gotta wonder too if you know guys like Eisenstein were inspired by dreams to to edit yeah. the way they did. You know. Yeah, I'm sure smarter minds have examined that. But uh, yeah, all those things I, I think is absolutely a thing because what is it that, I mean, geez, what was the, what was the earliest, one of the earliest ones was what, the the sleeping moon or the the bullet hitting the moon or something? Oh like, yeah, Moli <laughs> Melier's film, yeah. Yeah, something like that. I mean, that's like, yeah. that's as abstract a dream as you can have it, that you have like this, now you suddenly have a vision, on, uh, what, what you might call an objective uh perspective of the moon like where are you in relation to them it doesn't matter we're in front of the moon now it's like it's just a really that's i mean yeah it's cool stuff yeah it definitely seems like it would be inspired by a dream a lot of the wuxia stuff too is very it's so edit happy i mean did you were you inspired at all by the editing of these other i mean you know jackie chan's editing is very conservative like it's like mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. very like it makes a lot of sense all this stuff like requires very little brain power to kind of piece things yeah. together yeah. Did you watch much uh, wuxia or other, you know, other kind of like fantasy action films growing up? And did that inspire your um, your editing and filmmaking? Yeah, I don't know if inspired, but always it's always opened the buffet for me. And it was always a, a possibility and something that you can appreciate because I, I think there was maybe when people were starting to discover Jackie Chan in, in the late 90s or Hong Kong cinema in general, you know, there was like. I'm dating myself, but don't nod like you you know. That way you sound you look younger. But you know, in the late '90s, uh, a lot of folks were discovering Hong Kong movies for the first time and discovering Jackie Chan and wanting to see more. And then that opened the door to like seeing Wuxia and all this wire work. And so it was actually pretty polarizing. Uh, I don't know if it was just my my perspective, but a lot of people were like really picking camps and sides. Like this is real action. This is real martial arts. And the Wuxia is like fake. And you know, like distinguishing, but between what's fake when we're all playing make-believe at the end of the day it's just it was a weird thing but anyways um i never had that kind of distinction i never had that worry of the hang up oh it's wire suddenly you see one wire in a gag and it kills the whole fight i don't like the whole fight anymore like it's like it was a weird kind of like um 
I guess you call it kind of kind of gatekeeping, you know, about what what was a Hong Kong movie or what what is an was a good action movie as a whole. But you know, I grew up just appreciating all that, all the wire stuff and all the like the fantasy. And really it was just about showing power and grace and elegance. Really, that's the end goal of what all that is, right? Um you know, so in, a, like, in America, just on that note, real quick, yeah. in, in America, um, it does seem like we have I remember at the video store. We had this like very kind of like indie. Well, it wasn't just an indie. It had everything. And it had like, it had, they had like a hundred categories of films and they would get really nitty. But then one of those categories is fantasy. One of those is Western. One of those is, and you tend to have like an actor that does a genre and you have an actor that's over in these genres. But like in Chinese cinema, actors do all genres and it's the same with music like you buy an album and oh, yeah. every, there's no like genre <laughs> there's the actor and or the performer um so i wonder just i wonder if that's just like a different way of thinking <clears throat> about what a performer is and what a character is it's like okay well in this one they're flying around on wires defying physics and this one they're not and that's okay in the case of like hong kong films but in america i think maybe maybe some of us were like well why, why is he defying physics like i just saw him in a movie where he wasn't defying physics like we carry it over from film to film i wonder if that that might be like the culture gap there i don't know it's i mean yeah it's such a where is this i would call it stubbornness you know around why things have to be real and that kind of i don't know what it is maybe it's like just kind of a sense of what was a superpower i mean now we have superhero movies and that's kind of watched without much fuss you know we we all take it in and we understand it for what it is and and we watch it right so i mean you know you i don't know what it is i think there was there was again i maybe going back to kind of like what what constitute a real action movie there was all this gatekeeping around that as well i don't i don't know but it was just something again i still to this day it's just something i never really understood so it was just never an issue to me yeah and I, or kind of uh it never bothered me in terms of of it took me it never took me out of the story in terms of what it was you just kind of always went with it i mean you still i still see it today too in america where yeah you'll have you'll have a john wick style action movie and then you'll have an action movie where guys are just holding the guns you know in very kind of like theatrical ways and people will say well that's not how you hold a gun it's like you you didn't know that 10 years ago man like <laughs> like who are you to like say how to hold a gun now like everybody has to hold a gun like this now come on it's the age of uh tutorials we've all we've been watching too many tutorials in our life <laughs> which is fine you know it's like but i guess it's just understanding the the score right you know you don't you don't look at a uh i mean john wick is maybe probably the most recent tactical you know, type. And if we're talking about guns and firearms, that type of action that we've we've seen, and then you can't really compare it to a John Woo film. Like John Woo is like opera, and this one is like you know a grunge, like a grunge rock song. It's like these are all different things, and you can't really kind of say you know one's better than the other. They're just different styles and genres. Yeah, that's a great point. I couldn't find your film, Carmen's Virtue. I remember yeah. seeing it ages yeah, yeah. ago. I, mean, I think I don't remember where. <laughs> Where you where it was posted, I think Ken might have posted it on our forum or something like that. Um, but talk about you know when you started doing um, short films and actually releasing them and what that what it was like back then. <laughs> take take me to a time and place. Um, yeah, so I think Carmen's Virtue was a film that I made in co- co- college. I didn't go to film school, but I was doing uh, computer science. But I was. Uh, again, if we're talking about tensions of family and I was doing computer science to kind of make sure I was at a academic degree and a career that was, that could, I fall back on potentially. And if the film thing didn't work out, so that was all like, that was going on at that time, but I was also making films. I never stopped. I was continuing to make films. We were planning, you know, during the academic year and Ken, Ken, I think down, I think this when we had met, uh, maybe a couple of years after, but Ken was down in San Francisco, uh, going to school. Um, and we had connected through mutual friends because they were actually from Washington State. So we all, we already they were making action films when they were young. I was making action films when we were young. And like, you know, the community at that time, you know, if we saw anyone else that was doing something similar, like we gravitated towards each other and tried to find each other because, you know, it's such a small band of people that at that time that was doing stuff. Uh, but at any rate, so I knew Ken was going to come back for spring break, you know, come back home and try to plan a short film around that and try to try to figure out like how to make this production happen while going to school full time, which was not film school. Right. So it's just like a completely different day and night, literally going to school at day and then at night filming and stuff like that. And so that film came out, you know, uh, basically when I graduated college about the same time. 
And that's about the time that I started going to submitting it to film festivals and sending it out to, um, you know, all those places that would take us and be able to show the film. And that's probably maybe how you saw it or maybe it was online. Uh, but that's when we started to kind of realize what indie film distribution was because we started making a DVD out of it. At that time, you know, you just burn DVDs and stuff like that. So it was all manual. You, you know, put the labels in the in the cases and all the stuff and try to try to sell and ship. And that was like really the entree into not only making short films, because I had made short films before that, but also figuring out the distribution side of it and how to actually get in front of people. Um, whereas, you know, the full movie YouTube uploads at that time wasn't, you know, wasn't quite a thing. Uh, but, you know, how to get a film, either DVD or broadcast or, or in a film festival out to people. That was like the other aspect of just learning about filmmaking right it's also it's not just the technical a to z elements of making the film but also getting it out there and uh eric you know i have to say props to you because you definitely led the way as far as like figuring out distribution with all your connections with your audience the comic-con audience and it's just like we like this was something that we were watching you do as well and trying to figure out making you know, sure that you don't do what i did <laughs> <laughs> no don't you're doing that it, guy's doing <laughs> no, no you're doing it for sure so i mean yeah props to you was this your first action film? No, I did action shorts before that. Yeah, but this okay. was kind of the biggest like one with like other people because I think before uh, I was like doing it stuff with people who weren't martial artists and you try to figure out like how to fake it. Right. But now you yeah, have just like a legit martial artist and we had like another great, uh, you know, uh, talents that we were able to get over over Zanga or not Zanga but like Belong and Zanga actually Belong. Do you remember that site? Of course. Yeah. I found all these um, martial arts and trickers from Vancouver, which is like a two and a half hour drive um, from Seattle. So I got a lot of talent uh, or found guys to come down from that. Andrew Chin uh, was one of the guys that came down. Matter of fact, you know, he's now the stunt coordinator on CW Kung Fu. So it was like when I was uh, shadowing that show, it was a great you know, way to catch up and just kind of like, wow, can you imagine like 10, 15 years later where life has taken us? So it was super cool to kind of like reunite with Andrew from that perspective. That was a really interesting era then, because I, I remember that. Uh, I remember, yeah. remember that website because there was this, there was this sudden interest, like you said, in Hong Kong films, and then suddenly tricking becomes a thing. And it's like same time that that happens. Yeah. I don't know if it's, it's uh, fill me in because I don't know what the Cali scene, but it was non-existent in Washington state. Either I saw these belong videos, people were posting either from Vancouver or from SoCal or NorCal or, you know, like loop kicks and all those guys, like, like, it was just like, I didn't know how long they've been doing it, but it looked like they've been doing it for a long time because it, maybe it was that transition from sport karate or kind of like that world, but they started getting into like tricking, which was like a whole, you know, a whole nother thing. Yeah. I think, I think it was around like 98, 99 when people started doing, because if you look at Hong Kong films up until then, like nobody did those kicks, but then suddenly you start seeing these kicks a little bit more. And I can't remember the first time I started seeing like 540s just regularly in movies. Yeah, and yeah, like, yeah. like 540 hooks, right? <laughs> Jackie did a 540 in Miracles, right? So yeah. that had been around because of Wushu. But anything outside of Wushu. Anything outside of Wushu. Right? Right? Yeah, anything outside of Wushu suddenly was... I remember that because a lot of a lot of like the Hong Kong filmmaker guys, you know, like yourself and me, would team up with trickers so that they, you know, we get the moves. And it was this like really interesting kind of new mesh uh, yeah. like Hong Kong filmmaking with tricking um anyway that was that's just I, I never really put words to that but what was happening up until that time was you know Ernie Ray's junior school he was he was really kind of pushing sport karate into that you know yeah. high level uh demo demo team stuff right and that was just like a straight path into Hollywood oh 100 percent where like yeah you could do that or Wushu at, I can't remember what the school was in LA. It was before LAVC became the training place, but there was a Wushu place that was like all the rage because of Crouching Tiger and whatnot. So every actor who wanted to get into, you know, screen fighting or any stunt guy that wanted to get into acting, they would go to these places and learn these, learn these skills. And then like 20 years later, we kind of have the current state yeah. of martial arts and tricking as it is. Um, but anyway, uh, I, I'm curious. I think, I think when you were talking about like how everything kind of came to, that one flashpoint moment, but I think it was like a perfect storm because you have the internet and you have people wanting to do something. And then you have the internet as a way to connect and share video, upload actual full videos of you doing it. And then you start, everyone kind of reverse engineers. I don't know if like tutorials were a thing back then, but you know, a lot of folks who were really entrepreneurial, you know, would 
try to figure out how to reverse engineer these tricks and how to how to train themselves to do it. So that was like yeah. an interesting phase as well. That's how I learned butterfly twist in my backyard. Yeah. Watching <laughs> I think we all we all had those I call, moments. Yeah. I called it bilang, um, yeah. bilang, yeah. bilang. I, I would watch, bilang, watch bilang, them. Yeah, I'd yeah. watch Zero Gravity at the time. They had done they had done stuff oh, yeah. before us. Oh yeah. Um, when you went from working with guys that weren't real martial artists to working with someone like Ken, what like what was the action design process difference there? How did the action come about, and like who who designed it, and how did that all work? Mm, um, I'll tell you the first thing. First project that I did with Ken was actually a short film that they were making. Um, and uh, I just came out to help. So it wasn't really like, you know, they, they, were, they were definitely directing and I just kind of came out to be an extra pair of eyes or be able to help out in any way I could. Um, so I came over there and they were, I think it was like a spring break too, or just some weekend holiday break that they were filming. So they were filming and they were trying to figure out the choreography as they were going. Is this the infinite quest? Uh, so Ken was in two groups, his infinite quest, but also zero gravity. So those were like the, and some people and all those folks that were doing stuff at that time. But at any rate, uh, I came over there and they were doing some stuff. It was, it was an all nighter. It was probably one of the first all nighters I've ever pulled, but it's like, you know, we're <laughs> like, what is this? We're up all night. This is great. Um, but anyways, we were, we were filming and then he was, Kenny was choreographing and he was like, he, I could tell he just kind of hit a wall just in terms of like, and he just kind of goes, I don't know what to do here. Like I need help. And so then we all kind of started contributing and like Adam Phelps was also a ZG IQ guy and they all just started contributing. We all just kind of put in our two cents and that's how we started kind of building the scene off of there. And this was kind of like, I'll tell you, it was kind of a light bulb moment for me because also appreciating Ken for who he is as a person, as, as a collaborator. Uh, I really just respected the moment of him just saying, throwing up his hands and saying, I, I don't know what I'm doing. Help. I need help. Uh, because before that time, like I was like I was saying, I was working with folks who were not martial artists. And I always had to be on my shoulders to figure out and give an answer and like be that director and be that person to like just drive everything. And uh, and that moment of like really understanding what collaboration means. It's like saying, if you hit a wall, like, you know, the people around there are there to help you and, you know, accept that. And that's really kind of what blossomed into that relationship. So right now, you know, in terms of what we did uh, with all our work, it's like Ken is the action director, you know, he gave him the credit that he is an action director on that and he designs and figures out, but we also conversate and figure out, you know, what kind of makes sense for the story. And I direct. So it's like, that's kind of like the collaboration that I have with Ken in particular. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's never really like, um, I don't know, that's, I don't know if that answers the question, but yeah, it just kind of like evolves over the years. And, you know, when you work with martial arts people, uh, it becomes a shorthand. Obviously it's just an easier way of talking about, like, you know, the shots, you know, this is what we're gonna do, this type of gag, oh, you can reference a movie where it is what we're doing this little bit right here versus, you know, person who's non, non martial artist, it's like non, anything it's like you're just totally working from scratch and you're just almost like working with you know a molded clay and you're just trying to figure out how to make it work and <laughs> make it make it look passable versus like you know it's it's just an interesting process but actually that's kind of like now come full circle that's where like action filmmaking is now i think where you have a lot of leads of the films who aren't necessarily martial artists so you have to kind of learn that muscle and how to collaborate uh from that point of view as well when you're coming up with action, do you like to come up with it on the page? Or do you like to come up with it on set? Or what What do you, like, where are you on the spectrum there? Yeah, I tried both. I mean, like, like because you hear Jackie Chan is like, I choreograph and I don't know what I'm doing. I just do it on set. And you're like, wow, we can try that too. But, you know, you're sitting there and you're trying to figure it out. You're not Jackie Chan and you're not working at Jackie Chan's speed of his brain. But also he's he gets time. He gets to, you know, spend four or five months doing Drunken Master, just the final fight, right? It's like, it's a totally, it's, so there's a little bit of myth making, you know, to his interview. So you don't want to like drink the Kool-Aid too much because you start to realize this is not, it's not tenable and it's not sustainable, right? It's just not a way to work. And like the previs and the planning is, is I think really, really important. Uh, but it's also kind of being ready um, to write it on the page, at least for me, because I've been, I've been writing all my stuff. I, I write and direct so I can figure out what the story beats are and understand what's really important and just kind of like sketch out maybe some details about the fight. But ultimately, you know, you hand it over to the action team and let them interpret it 
And then it's a conversation about what you need for the story beats and what you need from that point of view. Uh, for me, that's kind of like the preferred process because just standing there on set and just now with expensive movies and how expensive it's like, it's just, you can't afford, you can't afford to sit around and do that. It's just not, it's not sustainable. Yeah, Which is, yeah, yeah. you know, the stuff that you're doing, like if we're talking about like doing, you know, AR capture and just kind of like that kind of like brings it back to that kind of like creative moment where you actually kind of work things out on the day. That's interesting. But just the way the machinery of filmmaking now is like you have to have everything communicated beforehand because it's not just your action team. It's your production design team. It's your cinematographer. It's everything like make it hair and makeup. All these things have to kind of happen in 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 orchestration to so when you actually film and that that i think the hardest part with that um that i've found is trying to so you've planned this fight to the death yeah. and now you're trying to execute it in a way where it looks not choreographed not yeah. in, like like it's like it's supposed to exist there right and then when you go and you shoot the thing and there's supposed to be a wall here and there's no longer a wall here and all the fight <laughs> needs that wall like where's the wall <laughs> the whole broken yeah. now yeah, uh, I mean, like, how much of that do you try and just leave on this, like, for the day? And like, I'm gonna leave like 20% of this, 50% of this. Let me attack it from two angles. Uh, you know, it's also like when you start working with actors and stuff like that. When when I, you know, I started really kind of like, kind of embracing the art of directing and and as a broader skill and not just action directing, right? But you work with actors and it's also they have a process too. And some of them like to do it on the day. Some people like to rehearse. Some people like that. For me, I, I want to make sure that we talk and discuss and shape it. We don't need to do line reads. We don't need to do scene you know, performances. But I just want to make sure the world is we're all on the same page in terms of creating and understanding. And I come with a plan about what the scene should be. And they should come with a plan of what they want to do with their characters. And that's the conversation around rehearsals. Now, come the day, there might be changes, yes, but in terms of like the set design, but you know, there shouldn't be little surprises, right? But if they feel like something different is pushing them to do a performance differently, I won't be opposed to that. You know, I will, even for myself, if I have a plan and it's just not giving shape and I see a better idea, then you throw it away. So that type of like um, hard preparation, but also being prepared to like throw it away is like, kind of where I would kind of see where action, how I kind of approach action too, because it's also like planning, discussing, but also prepared to change it if you need to, but understand why the change needs to happen. You don't just change in reaction, like you're in reaction mode and like, oh, we don't have this wall. It's like, oh, and then you just kind of flip around and just kind of run around with your head cut off. But if the wall's not there and you think, well, actually story-wise, I don't need the wall. We actually just need this little bit, this gag. And then it just kind of morphs, but you're also kind of surf it a little bit better. At least for me, I don't like I don't freak out when, you know, these kind of things happen because you're like you kind of done the preparation. So you're educated about the scene and what it needs and then you can kind of go with it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's I mean, in, a, in a perfect world, everybody has a plan and everyone kind of works together and, and it just goes without a hitch. Then that's great. Uh, but, you know, things happen and all these budgets or whatever. And then the, the sunlight or the weather might disagree with you. all those little things will happen. That's filmmaking. And so you're just kind of ready to kind of kind of cut kind of like uh yeah adjust to it but i don't know if that answers your question but yeah it's just kind of like it's it's just being able to be ready but uh be ready to change as well i know it's not a formula that you plug numbers into but that, that is that is good insight about actors and i i i mean i always ask directors and you know choreographers like what is it that stunt men and stunt women can learn from actors are you asking me that <laughs> asking you that because you've worked with a lot of actors a lot. And, and you've worked with a lot of actors who are stunt men and stunt women yeah, but, yeah. Uh, you know in just pure acting the pure acting world because you know you're an actor you have a process and as a stunt guy you have a different process man for the most part like when you're in stunt yeah. mode you're kind of thinking differently when you're in acting yes. mode, you're thinking this way so <clears throat> with that in mind what do you think stunt performers can learn from actors preparation from the character point of view you know it's also if, you know what studying if i don't know if you're an actor are you a double you know if you're learning how to double then it behooves you i think to watch the actor work and just do a dramatic scene just see how they move and how their how their limbs kind of like hang and just like all those little human studies that a, a double should be doing to really understand you know who who they are doubling and how to make it like make it a good match right 
so that's one thing. Um, I think the other thing is just that the art of preparation of an actor is very different because it's almost like very personal and the, they come to the work, a good actor should come to work, you know, very well prepared, understanding their character, understanding where. So I think a stunt actor who's doubling if or just doing stuff should also understand what the story is as well, just the same, but also from an action point of view, what kind of like could accentuate these ideas and and, and all those things. Um, I know that answered, but I think from the business point of view, stunt actors can learn, stunt people can learn acting and help your career. Because if you can learn to say a few lines and throw a few punches, that gets you a more feasible part. You know, I mean, that gets you roles that's a little more, um, that can get you, that can get you work. If you're just kind of a stunt person that is, doesn't have the acting chops, right? Then that just kind of limits your possibilities and opportunities. Mm -hmm. So just from a business point of view, it, it behooves, you know, at all stunt folks to be able to kind of like at least be able to say a few lines convincingly because then you can have a, a speaking line and punch <laughs> so sound advice it's true yeah. did you find through all this that your uh, computer science degree is helping you <laughs> in your career this this one's for your parents yeah 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 well i learned yeah how to how to burn and hack license keys for final cut pro <laughs> yeah. you know whatever it took right whatever it took i think yeah the technical elements of just burning cds and dvds you know there's all kind of like uh, things that helped me make it. Uh, computer science actually, I don't know if it like gave me anything, but computer science is actually, you know, very a logic problem solving algorithm, right? How, how do you attack a problem? You know, how do you solve a problem uh, and, and, and find the most efficient way possible? So that kind of, I appreciated that from a thinking standpoint. And that's, I don't know if it rubbed off on me, but that, that is definitely how I kind of approach things and think about, you know, how do you execute a scene, you know, and the, the same logic is like one bite at a time, right? You don't just try to take on the whole thing, but computer science teaches you to kind of like do one function and one thing that does this. And then now you have this going on and then everything else will all come together. And so, yeah, from that point of view, yeah. My, I don't know uh, if it was worth the tuition, but yeah, this, but there yeah, you go. <laughs> yeah. I, my first job was um, visual, visual basic and PHP programming and web design. And that's oh, how yeah. I made the website w website. Uh, I mean, I always learn how to be entrepreneurs, make the website, make a uh, sales, sales site and all those. A lot things. of us, man, a lot of us did that <laughs> stuff. Um, but I, I've always said that like the, the thing that computer science and programming teaches you is to think in terms of how people will act rather than how they should act. And yep. that always helped me as as a leader. It's like, OK, I, I, I can't keep getting I can't keep telling these guys to wake up at 6 a.m. to go do my movie for free. Like, let's just figure out. Let, let me just figure out like what they will do. And I can work within that. Right. So yeah. <laughs> it just yeah. kind of creates a realistic frame. Not that people are computers, but, yeah. you know, you are as a computer science you know, scientists, whatever. Sci you're call me a right. scientist. Yeah, and you're also creating kind of a, a situation where, like, you just know that you're creating you're creating a piece of art, and it like you've got in you've got people who are like doing labor as an input, yeah. and then you have people who are enjoying it as an output, and so that interface between you as a programmer or a filmmaker, and between you and the various people that you're interacting with, really kind of helps sometimes to think more along the lines of like. Like what's what what realistically can I ask of people yeah. right now? You yeah. know, I always felt that that was very helpful. So, yeah, parents, uh, if you're always... listening to this, uh, it was well yeah. worth it. Trust me, yeah, well worth it. Still paying off the loans, but it's okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but like you say, on the other end is also like the other aspect that we never really got into, but I I started to learn and appreciate later. But is the UX right? You know, US user experience is basically audience experience, right? What is the audience and how are they accessing kind of like what you're saying? You can't really force them to understand, like, but how do you come to them and present the options? And same with storytelling. How do you present the story to them in a way that's accessible and understandable? Your film really is a UX. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was one giant UX experiment. How else do you find information about like what could work with an audience? Do you read philosophy? Or do you read psychology? Anything like that? Uh, you just have to rep it. I mean, it's all about, it's, there's not much mystery behind it. You just have to keep doing it and just figure out what works or also look, appreciate what's working inside of you when you see something really good or something you laugh at and just kind of pause and go, well, why did that make me laugh? And just kind of like reverse inspect what that is. But, you know, it's just, that's the challenge of this art that we do. It's just not, 
it's not a plug and play thing. It's not a re repeatable thing. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And that's the, that's the gambling risk that we all do as storytellers. And that's kind of like, but when it works, it's great, right? And so that's something that we, you know, you mentioned testing. That's something that we were really, um, me as a produ my producers and my editor and just our, uh, what we were really intentional about trying to get out of these test screenings. And it wasn't just a peer, you know, taking a pulse and like, did they like it? Did, did they not like it? It's really like what was playing, what was working, what could be better? And and just figure out how we can take that feedback in a meaningful way and not just react to them just not liking the A, B, and C. Well, of course, like whatever it's like, but how do you figure out how that can be improve your work? Do you know what I mean? So it's like, yeah. like I think that's something that from what I heard, like the pitfalls of studio testing is like, they're very reactive. Like if anyone reacts to anything negatively, like everything just, you know, gets gets cut and shorn in a way that's just like at the end of the day, it's like you don't have a movie anymore. But, you know, there's a thoughtful way of doing test audiences. I, I'm, test audiences are very useful, but you just have to be able to use it in the right way and, and be as helpful to to your process as you can, you know? Yeah, it does seem like the studio testing, the studio testing uh, experience <laughs> model is, it's a lot, it seems a lot like kind of your standard kind of scientific laboratory experiment where <laughs> like, I don't know if, first of all, I don't really know if those reactions are realistic anymore. Yeah. Uh, some things just don't work on some nights and sometimes, you know, it's like, ask a stand-up comedian, man, yeah. they're the best at this. And they'll tell you like, you don't yeah. know. <laughs> and that's why they're great because they've been able to kind of like Bob and weave wherever they need to. And yeah. it seems like studios might not be built like that. Was there a moment, um, when you were doing testings and when you had to go back to the drawing board uh, that sticks out in your memory? Well, for the Paper Tigers, we had uh, some edits from the script that, so in the original version, the, I don't know, we'll put the spoilers, hopefully people have seen it, but there's the villain at the end basically commits a ritual suicide. <laughs> When he loses to the hero, you know, he's he's faced with such shame that he's like, I'm just going to throw myself off the roof. And we filmed that. That was scripted and we filmed it. And that was actually in the edit for the longest time. And I just kept it in because I was kind of like hem and hawing about it. And we did the test screening with it in. And I think a lot of folks reacted to it adversely or negatively in kind of different ways. And so that was kind of enough for me to say, OK, you know, it's not about me. And if it's not working, it's just not working and figure out how to weigh be able to get it out so that's kind of the one that kind of stood out because it was kind of a thing that you really don't know until you actually have someone sit in front of it uh because for a movie like i've, I've been doing for trying to make the movie for 10 years in my head right and so the, there's a lot of things in and residue in your your head and your ego that you want to try to do and you think it works but you know if it doesn't if it doesn't the square doesn't fit into the round hole. It's like, it's just not going to work. So you have to kind of uh, accept the reality at that point. So that's what the test screening, I think was really important to give me that. At the end of the day, they're very visceral. And when they get into the notes or when you actually like start asking them like really particular points and really for them to give notes and reasons why, it's like, that's when you start getting lost in the weeds uh, because it's like, they're they're not film critics. You know, we, we intentionally got our test audience for non-movie people, people who were not, filmmakers like i think filmmaker test screenings are are the worst <laughs> to be honest like <laughs> I, it's like they're just like everybody's just gonna say this is what the movie i would make and that's not really helpful yeah. but you're trying to figure out like what what plays and what works with an audience or not so we were very that's the intentionality that we wanted to do our test screenings is to have folks that just didn't didn't know movie or you know were not filmmakers and give that visceral feedback and they can tell you the the high level notes that you, you should listen to. But, you know, when it starts getting into the nitty gritty of like why they feel that way, it's like some of that stuff is just kind of more residue than anything. Do you, uh, do you read YouTube comments? Yes, of course. <laughs> I do, think you take, do you take them seriously on for your projects? Uh, define seriously. Well, like you said, high level, like, do you listen to the high level comments and how do you parse all that out? That's an interesting question. I think I we look at it from a marketing point of view and we're like trying to figure out what's taking off and what's not. So that kind of figures out our next step of how to campaign a social media or like as you, so this is just kind of the business hat and you see who, who, who oh, oh, they're really reacting to the action or they're reacting to the comedy. And then you kind of lean heavy on that in, in terms of the next marketing phase. That's one thing. I don't know if I look at it as validation. You know, I think that's kind of a slippery slope. I think maybe subconsciously we all do, but you know, you try not to kind of like take that in positive and negative 
All right. Even if it's like really effusive, like you, you know, it's great. You say thank you and, and all that, but you know, there's also the negatives and then, you know, it's a big enough world that we're all grown ups. I, I think it's, it's what it is, but yeah. I don't know. I, I can't imagine like the, the level of like, if we're talking about like a really, really a list, you know, the type of feedback, I don't know if they're sitting there reading mean tweets or Social media, but we're just reading figure out how to how to market the film and and more from that point of view, and just trying to you know gauge reaction. Yeah, the, the the terrible thing too about the algorithm, and I say the algorithm like it's monolithic and it's not. <clears throat> YouTube has this algorithm. Overall, the algorithm is actually I think it's pretty good. Yeah. But I remember one time somebody left a comment on a video, and he noted that there was this like logical kind of inconsistency in one of my movies. Yeah, and. uh and I, and I was like, uh, I was like, you know what, that, that was actually a debate on set and nobody's really brought that up before. So it's interesting that you noted that. Right. And I, and I replied, I said, thank you for the comment. That was actually very thoughtful. And then I got like 15 more notifications of people saying the same thing. Oh yeah. And it's not because more people were noticing it. It's that the algorithm thought that I liked those comments more. So it was showing me more <laughs> comments so it's like all those all that criticism had probably already been there it was just now showing me all that criticism <laughs> yeah but if i had responded to the hey hell yeah bro thanks great job and then i probably would have gotten more of that so that is something that i think people need to be very cautious of on these platforms because the platform will try and show you stuff that it thinks you want to be interacting with yeah as a creator you mean yeah yeah. yeah like, and, or anybody really like if you're just responding to, like it probably knows well, i don't know oh. i don't know how it works but i wanted to talk about the short that you did before uh, paper tigers i want to talk about paper tigers for sure yeah. um actually two of them uh one was bookie and i remember seeing it a long time ago and thinking like well here's a very interesting take uh <laughs> and because you know ken i don't think many of us thought of ken as an actor because we were watching him doing zero gravity short films like, oh, this guy can move pretty cool. And then he's in this like jazz short film, black and white. And I was like, oh, what was the uh, the uh, the birth of that project like? Like, how did it, how did you come up, uh, come up with that one? Yeah, I think, first of all, I mean, Ken is just such a fun, charismatic person. To, you know him and, you know, if you know him, you love him. It's like he's just like a really fun personality. So uh, we always knew like the potential that he has and has uh, continues to have. Um, but it's like, it's, it's, I'm trying to think of bookie what it was. I'm just trying to, I think I was just listening to a lot of music at that time. I was listening to a lot of jazz R and B and then like the world of the, the nightclub was just such an, a, a weird, uh, 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 attractive and film noir and all those things were something that, you know, I was just watching it and consuming a lot, uh, at, at that time. So I think I just wanted to be able to kind of tell a story around that. I think I'm trying to think of, um. I think I always had Ken in mind uh, for the part. I definitely wanted him to kind of play the lead role because I think he was ready for it and he definitely had the potential to be able to do it. But it was also an opportunity for ourselves to kind of give ourselves that shot. I think it was also like it was like creating something that kind of could stand out other than just, you know, an action short, but it also just kind of be able to find a world and a story that can make sense for it. I still have my copy and it's signed. Yeah. Right on. I'll sell it to you. It's going to <laughs> sell it back to me. I might be a short a few coins. I might need it. <laughs> yeah, no, I still remember it because it's like, it just really stood out at the time because I think everybody was, everybody at the time was really jockeying to, we're all like, there was, a, it was around like, like that early born phase, but it was still that kind of Hong Kong, like post handover era. So we we're all trying to vying to do like the most badass action scene, right? Like the hardest <laughs> balls and all this. <laughs> yeah. um, and then to just see something come at, at an angle like that was really refreshing. I appreciate that your concepts are like a little bit out of left field and I don't know what you do to avoid <laughs> the pitfalls of just like doing the same stuff that everybody else is doing. Um, but I'll just throw that out there and say that, uh, you know, that's a great film. And I, with, okay, here's one, the fact that it's about jazz, like you, you have this interest in jazz. Is this an interest that goes back further is it the seattle scene in particular or and maybe to answer the question I, we kind of glossed over it but you know when i grew up making films i i was mentored by Corey yoon so i mean that was like the biggest encounter that i could have uh, as a kid you know his so his his sons went to school with me so that was just a chance encounter for a kid who didn't know how to was figuring out filmmaking on his own but to have the mentorship of Corey from that and his biggest lesson was like 
is that you can't have good action without a good story. And that's what really, I think, was the touch point because like, oh, it's not just all punches and kicks. I thought, you know, I thought this would impress you because you know? <laughs> I did I did all that stuff. I showed him, it was like, yeah, it was like, yeah, but you know, where's the story? Like he just kept pushing me to think about story because kind of going back to what we were talking about, designing action or, or creating action for stunts. And it's like every decision that you have around choreography should based on what's happening in the scene, what's happening in the story and the characters. It's not just, you know, a, a conglomeration of all these stunts and action, which is fun, you know, but, you know, does anyone watch Ong Black for the movie? Like, like, does, does anybody watch it for like the elephant? I don't know. Well, I, I, I gotta <laughs> say, like there was this kind of like relevant theme that they were pulling at. Human it is. It is. I, I didn't mean to pick on it, but yeah. I would say most of it is like highlight reel, at least for me. It's like, yeah. it's just like kind of like, it's like really it's five like, minutes of the movie. Yes, yes, this is great. But um, but that's the thing that really was separated my vision about what, you know, really it was kind of like, it's a bit of like an ego death, to be honest, because I, you know, I hear you when you were talking about everyone was vying for for doing all these big action. And I think it was Tony Jaw at that time, really. Everybody was like really just trying to chase that. And for me, it was like, I just don't know if this is something creatively that's that works with what he's telling me. I just need to be able to find my own path in the same way that like Jackie Chan kicked high, punch low and all that kind of like, you have to be able to find your own path and create all those things. So when we talk about bookie or pair tigers or anything, it's like, to me, it was just having your antennas open to that type of way of looking at the world. And then things start to kind of fall into place. So I can't like tell you this one spark or one thing that really like was a reason of making bookie. It was just a way of looking at the world. Like, I was just listening to my playlist and I was like reading in the world of Seattle and like jazz clubs and all those things. And all those things kind of like come to place where you're in the place that you can be inspired and be ready for it. Uh, so I know it's kind of an esoteric way to kind of speak to it, but I mean, it's really just a, I just wasn't trying to outvie action stuff or do anything it's like that, you know, and it's almost like I kind of knew that we could do it. It's just like, I don't creatively at the end of the day, maybe it was for me kind of like understanding uh, how films were being seen, especially at film festivals and audiences and how at, at the end goal and how the end result, how it's going to be received. If you do a fight movie or a fight short, it's like, it's, it's cool, but it doesn't really resonate. And it's the ones that have a story that can really like have traction with the audience. And that was also, you know, a touching, a touch point for me to, to kind of learn from that as well. I think that, that brings a good point up uh, that, you know, anybody who's, <sighs> And look, I've fallen into that claptrap myself where I was just trying to figure out like, okay, well, the latest thing is the raid. Okay, how do I do something like the raid? And there is this sort of like funneling of everybody's attention to like the one thing that you should be doing right now in the action world, that is. And okay, John Wick comes out. Okay, how do how do we all do John Wick? Like, how do we do a movie where the gun is held like this and and we kill a dog at the beginning, right? Like, people get really kind of like narrow focused on that. And I don't know if that's a product of I don't know if that's a product of being in LA. Like, do you find that being separated and living in Seattle, like it kind of gives you freedom from that kind of tunnel thinking? Yeah, I'm sure it does. I think that's it definitely, you look at everything from a scan. And like I say this because I appreciate it. I, I appreciate all these uh, fight shorts that people are putting out because they're just being creative. And I, I love it. I like just from, just from a fan, I love being able to watch what people are doing. So it's super cool. But if we're talking like macro view of where trends are and how like things are, you know, John Wick train and now we're, you know, what, whatever train that we're on in the moment, like those things I never really kind of like ascribe to, like, it's just not something that uh, I'll watch it. I'll see what's going on out there. But creatively for me, it's really a question. Like if I'm going to spend years, three, four years in the case of paper tigers, 10 years doing something like, is it really worth chasing a trend for 10 years? And, you know, as you can tell trends change. Right. And so those are things that not, don't really kind of give me that spark and that fuel to kind of really push forward in a way. So I want to be able to have something that I'm interested creatively, something interested as a human being uh, to be able to work on a story for that long. I find the same kind of freedom because um, I've never lived in LA. Yeah. Same and, with you, man. Yeah. And that has, that has its problems because you're off the radar. So you have to do things in a very different way, but being off the radar 
like you said, it allows you to get this kind of like bird's eye view. You're like, okay. Well, I mean, I think there's a place for all. Like I'm, I like, uh, I can pop into LA and, and I know folks and I'm connected with enough folks and talk to people. Obviously I kind of get a, a pulse, but yeah, that day-to-day -day stuff, I think that's really important. I, I think it really helps. If it helps you, it helps you, you know, I think just for my personality and my, my taste is just, I, it was never uh, a world that, you know, I, that I really want to dive into. Yeah. Agreed. Um, can you talk about the next short you did, um, the challenge or is it the challenger? Yeah. The challenger. How did that come about? And I'll just love to hear more about that. Cause that's one of my favorite action shorts. I'll just say it right oh, now. Well, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we're going to put that tagline. We're going to put it on our DVD. <laughs> well, yeah. Sign it for me. Send me a copy. Right, on. <laughs> right on. Thanks man. Um, <laughs> well, that was like probably at the, the beginning stage of trying to raise money for the paper tigers. And something, if you can see the elements in that, we were playing a lot with the slow motion and even the character whose name is Danny and stuff like that. We we're trying to play with, you know, visually as a camera test, even just as, as from that point of view, what that would look like, you know, for the final feature film. So it was meant to be, and this is kind of a bit of a diversion because it was meant to be like, you know, kind of a, a fundraising piece and just kind of like helped kind of kickstart it. Not, not necessarily a, a sizzle or a concept reel, but it was also like we were camera testing inside, but also trying to give it a little bit of visual story. It is a sh action fight short, you know, kind of coming full circle to what I was talking about. But, you know, we wanted to give a little bit of beats of story and give, you know, a silent, uh, it's a silent film to be able to kind of tell the story of who these guys were and what the culture of this Kung Fu culture, this Baymo culture of what that is visually. Um, so yeah, so that's a long story short, but we, we had, uh, you know, Ken was always going to be action director and, and that was the process. Uh, but finding our young Danny was, you know, a bit of a, I don't want to say challenge, but that was like, that was the task that we had to figure out. Uh, Andy Lee was like, I'm, I was watching his stuff, you know, always watching his stuff for, uh, a lot of years before that, um, big fan of him. And, uh, we had reached out to him and, and see if he was available thankfully he was and it was like a total low you know it was a freebie short that we all did and 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 he was able to be part of it which was great and uh yeah i mean some magic came out of that so i think uh i think that's kind of like the closest thing to what we were trying to say was like this is classical kung fu right this is like our classical form of of kung fu but maybe that's where we failed it as a pitch because Paper Tiger was, was actually a sloppy form of Kung Fu. It was a messed up, you know, janky. It was meant to be like jazz version of Kung Fu where this is like as Shaw Brothers, as classical, as Chris, as we could do it. Just to show that we could do it. I don't know if, what questions we were trying to answer, but we just wanted to be able to show like this is Kung Fu. This is a Kung Fu movie. So what is the process of making a Kung Fu movie in that case? Because... Like the camera and choreo and performance, they all work pretty well together, man. So what, like if you're like, just take an example of any shot in that um, yeah. and the process for coming up with it and executing it. I think it starts with talent. I mean, like if you can't afford to CG or body doubles or anything, like they, these guys are the stars. And so you have stars as anything else. Like you have Andy Lee and Ken Kitagua uh, duking it out. So, I mean, you start from there and Andy has a great, great martial arts background obviously you know with tricking background but also martial arts background as well and ken ken is like the encyclopedia there of kung fu so you just kind of let them go at it and see what what comes out of it and you just figure out you know your shot design is how, how you can kind of create around that um I'm trying to think of how long the process was it was pretty much the way i approach every short with ken or every, you know with paper tigers with ken it's like these are the story beats this is what we need to kind of figure out and see and now kind of fill in the blanks and, and color color in the lines there. And so that's how he had kind of went off and did his homework and design. And we had a few rehearsals with Andy. I think we had like maybe three or four sessions uh, before even filming, before we even did any camera shot blocking design, just understanding Kung Fu body and Kung Fu movement and stuff like that. Because I think at that time, Andy, I mean, all credit to Andy, it's just he's a very talented martial artist. But uh, we also wanted to kind of give a little bit more of a that Southern kind of like more grounded kind of work whereas he's like at that time you know really known as a high flyer and we wanted to kind of give that little more definition around what this kung fu would be it was a little more specific about what the kung fu versus a generic kung fu right so we wanted to give like certain shapes and colors and things that he was like all in for because he's a huge student of lao ka Lung and all that stuff so he's like andy's all credit to andy and just seeing what he's done and 
him and his brother, Brian, just what they've been able to do up to now. It's like, it's all a credit to their hard work. I mean, they were busting their butts, you know, way back then. So he was, he was young and hungry and still, and that's exactly who you get. I don't know. Have you met Andy? Yeah, I met him once. Met him at Comic Con. Oh, Comic Con. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That was the first time I ever met him. And then oh, they're, word. Okay. And they were whisked away by their manager. So. <laughs> oh, well. oh well. Bye. Um, there was Tom again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but as you can see, it's like I, you know, first time before meeting him, you kind of see is he's just a very strong, gung ho personality, and you're like, wow, is this like real? Is this like a put on? I don't understand. But you meet him, he really is who you see. And I love that about him. He's just really such a genuine, genuine uh, person. And, and his heart is so full of passion for Kung Fu. I plan on interviewing Ken at some point. But yes. are you are you thinking of, when you think of action, because you have, on the one hand, you have the very systematized, uh, perfect shapes of Venom's. Lagala mm -hmm. has like a lot of like very, actually more Semohung has like the very like precise beats. On the other end of it is the jazz where it feels a little bit more, a little bit less staged, right? Yeah. Because there's a beauty to both of those, right? Mm -hmm. Like on the one hand, you have these perfect shapes that align and it makes like a geometric pattern where you remember it and you think like, oh, it's like a light show. It's like a, it's like a parade, you know? Yeah. And then the jazz version is there's more danger. There's more, you know, there's less rhythm. Maybe there's more breakbeat. There's more surprises. Um, when you're thinking of action, where are you? Are you classical, you know, like beat, 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 or are you jazz? Or are you somewhere in between? A uh, story. I mean, really, it's like whatever tool does the job. I, you know, if there's, to me, it just starts from there. If if you're asking my taste, like I like it all. I really like and appreciate it all in terms of like what our, 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 our I guess, sensibilities are. Like, I think it's, you know, very US or Western based. So we, we want a little more impact. So I think the stuff like Lixamo is really interesting. But also, if you're going to do shapes, you know, if the story calls for it, go for it. Um, it's interesting. I mean, did you see everything everywhere all at once? Like, that's... I haven't seen it all, no. Okay, yeah. So, I mean, that's that's kind of what I appreciated uh, from what Andy and Brian had choreographed, is, like, that's the world. You have, like, all these multiverses. So every universe, multiverse kind of justified the type of action that was in that. And so it all kind of, like, gelled in a really nice way for that. So it just kind of depends on what you what you want to do. And, you know, I think, um, I think about this a lot though. I think about what sync sound does to action because you think about all the stuff from the seventies and eighties, all the stuff was dubbed and dubbed in, in terms of the voices, but also you get to lay over really monster sound effects that are like way beyond the scope of anything that you hear in real life or any, it's just so, um, uh, what's the word, uh, almost like pushing into like surrealistic sound, right? And you have these cut points that are really dramatic and just like really like pedicab driver, like those cuts are just so precise, but the sound kind of carries it along in such a way. And mm -hmm. I don't know if you can do that one-to-one -one anymore because then when you're sync sound, like everything's kind of like very um, to reality. You know, it's more when you do something that's in sound, that's it's you have to sync it to reality. Whereas I think those bumps are so operatic and so big that it plays and works really well. You know, I've thought about that a lot because so much of, so much of, well, when I, when I lay action on the the timeline and premiere, a big part of how I make the action kind of sing is I change the pitch on all the sound effects. So if you use the same sound effect 15 times, yeah. I'll change the pitch where I'll just change it until it just sounds good. So it's like, da, 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 da. so it makes like some kind of, yeah. some kind of rhythm there. But I think something that people don't, think about too much is that uh all of the hong kong films they also post dubbed all the voices on the fights yeah and those voices those voices tend to come after the sound effect yeah. because if you put it on top of the sound effect then you're then it's going to peak too much and so it's going to yeah. kind of ruin it so by doing this you get this like bang for your buck where not only do you get meaty sound effects and they also don't use music which i think is still something that people are afraid to do to this day <laughs> to do a fight with no music is like terrifying yeah. Um, but then that that allows them then to keep on punching up the sound effects. They become like larger than life. But then that the voice that comes after, it's the it creates this kind of song. Yeah. And I think that like that's probably factored in as they're on set where they're like, well, it's gonna be bop, 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 bop. And they kind of know that there's a song pattern to it. Yeah. I guess that's where they are kind of in the opera, the opera side of the of the spectrum there, which is very song based. 
Mm -hmm. right? Versus, I guess with sync sound, I don't know. I'm kind of riffing on what you just said. No, no, I think it's there's something to that because also like if you don't know that rhythm, if you go into if the action design, because really like the action team kind of signs off by the time you shoot in this traditional modern filmmaking, the action team signs off and basically delivers the film in the can. But once it goes to post, it's like a whole nother, you know, many other hands, unknown hands kind of touch it. And like you say, if you don't know where to put those kind of sound beats on those rhythms and spaces, then, you know, that's stuff that gets lost in the mix. Cause actually I, you know, I'll, I think the best test of anything now, if we're talking about the other side is the best test of anything is just watch it on mute and just turn off the sound and just see if the cuts work and the images kind of, if they flow and work together or not. And uh, I would say a lot of stuff, times it some of them do work. It's just some of the, when you actually turn on sound, it just kind of muddies, like you were saying, it takes away and it, and it, it kind of like just takes away from the edge of it all. So it's like that the sound is like the third element that, you know, is not talked about when we talk about action design, we just kind of talk about the performance and the cutting and the framing and, but the sound is like a whole nother element. I think I first started really noticing it when um, Johnny Nguyen put out a film from Vietnam. Um, I can't remember which one it was. It's a bunch of people fighting in the mud and um, in the, the fight sounds were all done. They're all sync sound. They were done on location. And so every punch was height, 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 height. Yeah. Every yeah. voice was the same. And I had to mute it because it started getting monotonous. And then I, and then it got better. But yeah. with Hong Kong films, I would never in my life mute those because like yeah. there's such a song. There's like an art to the sound design. Yeah. It's uh, I mean, that's those are kind of the uh, those hidden little elements. You know, everyone can kind of do 720 or 10, 1080 or whatever. But those how do you actually kind of stitch these pieces together and kind of really yeah. make those are like the hidden hidden game you know yeah, you might be able to do a 1080 whatever but i can ruin it <laughs> in, a, in a flash <laughs> uh well going back to the challenger one of the inspirations yeah. was like the grandmasters like one cover wise like grandma like i love the action that phenomenal that's as shape as you can get and the sound design is you know next level like if you, the sound design is so good in that film that we were like trying to chase like who did the sound and we were actually trying to book you know the the people that did that um but anyways we found our our cool sound designers like okay just do what they did on grandmasters but like that was like that was like uh as good as peak form of anything that was sync sound so maybe i take it all back so you did a great job with sound design on that one because i did not mute it <laughs> what you. did Corey, what did Corey think of that one did you, what, what is he uh the challenge the challenge yeah he said it was great i mean it's Oh, you know, you never get a great from them. You get it like a not bad or like, yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah. So um, keep working at it. Keep working, yeah, keep working at it. It's like, but that's a win. That's a win and everything. So I know you've done a million interviews about it, so I don't want to like retread anything. I do want to talk about action design process, uh, who contributed, you know, how it looked on the page versus how it ended up. Uh, you want to talk just in general about, what process you wanted to because you said it's more of a more of a dirty kind of jazzy style of of martial arts right was that intentional from the beginning yeah yeah and that was one of the going to be the hard parts of really i mean ken and i just talked about it for 10 years you know we were just kind of keep circling the planes and just talk about what it could be when we didn't have the money yet and just trying to figure out you know just talking blue skying right and just talking about the action and, and yeah, we wanted to say it was street straw brothers in a street fight. Um, and just trying to understand like what that means. Cause we didn't even know what that meant because it's just like you had an idea and you had, you were trying to go for something, you know, those hints of, you know, your shop along, you know, kind of that improvisational kind of movement and just kind of like the move beats between the beats and not just like the choreographed uh, pieces themselves, those qualities, but also the quality of just being messy. You know, just not being, you know, you see Donnie Yen, yes, he's great, but these characters who are out of shape, you know, what does that look like? What does it look like to be a little bit out of step? What does it look like to be just kind of like off off a beat and just get tagged when you could have blocked it, but your block kind of comes in after, you know, like how do you kind of like express those type of uh, ideas and, and emotions and especially because you're trying to be in the world of the characters. So those were all kind of abstract and, you know, I'll, him and I were just really openly honest. It's like, I don't know what this look like. We just didn't know. There was no really answer until you actually had the actors in front of you, and then you start to see what you know, what what your what cards you were dealt, right? I, I I was I was hoping you weren't going to say that you went out and just started fighting old people to see what they did. We um, did that. Yeah. You did that too. Okay, good. Bodies are hidden, so we don't we, don't we need do behind it. the scenes, man. <laughs> yeah. 
they don't speak the, the, the dead don't speak um but uh yeah i mean that was kind of like what we were just kind of blue skying for the longest and maybe it was just seeping into we could like compare we'd share each other like fight all these fight videos we see online and all these like different things even just little qualities of of this little judo match or just something that little move that this person hesitated or just kind of like tripped his foot like just that little bit and we were like okay can we take all these qualities and put this all into yeah. a, f a film yeah. and so that was kind of like the things that we were just kind of idiating until you have the actors again like you don't know what you're dealing with until you have the actors and then you actually have to you know figure out what 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 you're going to do because they're at the end of the day they have to do it right because we didn't have doubles again this is a low budget film we don't have doubles or cg like they're going to do their own stunts and they're going to do their own fighting and whatever fighting skill or fighting ability that they had prior to this need to be trained or honed or embraced even for for the film so during the rehearsals that we were doing obviously you have marshall club andy and brian you know philip dang like they were doing their thing and so it's fun to have that contrast to let them be the high flyers and then you have these guys who can't jump at all like that's kind of like the thing that you want to go um and then you start to see what what they do so with elaine who plays danny uh he had done some taekwondo and he had done some um i think he had done some break dancing uh earlier on so it kind of gave him a bit of a body knowledge ron is probably the most experienced of the bunch ron yuan who's he played in like in countless roles uh but you know he had the size also he had you know i had asked him to gain some weight and you know he had gained like 40 50 pounds for the role so obviously you're going to move your body in a different way than not even you're used to you might be you know he, as skilled a martial artist as he is now he's got way more weight than he's ever had and now we're asking him to do the choreography so that obviously shapes and informs uh that and then we have Mikhail shannon jenkins who had done some boxing he was in undisputed so he had some like kind of more fisticuff kind of more street fighting experience but we were giving some jujitsu holds and jujitsu moves because of the character and so that's all those all those things that kind of navigate what the actors are going to bring to the table and that then it comes to on the day so the conversation with uh the action team it was ken kitagua sam lock and Kerry wong they were the action team and just kind of the conversating around like story-wise what things I wanted to do and what I wanted to have. But after that, it was kind of like, you know, break the huddle and, and go at it because they would go off and rehearse. And, you know, in, in an indie film, and I'm sure as, as films get bigger and bigger, like the director has like a lot of other kind of uh, topics and meetings to have. So you have to kind of let give the action team as specific marching orders as you can so that they can figure out what the action is. Uh, so that's kind of like what they wanted to be able to do with them and then like even on the day when we we're filming things happen differently you know a kick doesn't go in the way you want it and then you're like oh he just can't like kick in that angle and now you have to kind of like embrace that versus trying to force him to make mm -hmm. that picture perfect you kind of go well how do we how do we embrace that because he can't kick that high you're right this character is right for this character and there's one where ron does a spin kick and he falls like you know i think he was finding annie in the, in the pool and he does a spin kick and he falls like that was a real fall <laughs> he just got back up again and that wasn't like the choreography per se but we're like that's what you want like let's just do that that's a print i remember um, that i remember that going like that was real but i want right? to I believe that he made that one up so <laughs> <laughs> i know i know that's like me when i just kick the kick the paddle for the first time after a month it's like all right yeah, yeah. I'm gonna just eat it yeah. <laughs> exactly but so so the, again it kind of goes back to preparing but also being open to surprises or things that happen on the day and you embrace it and then you go down and you really kind of pull that up. Uh, so, I mean, that's, that's kind of the whole thing. And then not to mention what we did with the younger uh, cast, you had Yoshi Sodarso, Peter Sodarso and Guy De Silva and Mark Paletti. Like those guys are, you know, peak physical form. So we got to really have fun with what that was going to look like, what their action was going to look like. Cause those are two different, two different flavors. And when you see it in the film intentionally, so, cause you, we want to see, how big a cliff they were going to fall off as older, older men. Right. And like, look, look at these great Adonises over here, but then now you have these three schlubs. It's cool, man. Cause you, <clears throat> you kind of capture that as I get older, uh, I start to kind of understand older characters now. And I actually, I start to want to see more old characters kind of falling down. And, and this is something that like, I, I keep on, I wish Jackie would do it more often uh, where he would just play like an old injured man. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's kind of like, I don't know, appreciate the effort uh, in, in doing that because it, it makes it, it is in a way, it is actually a very Jackie thing, what you're doing mm -hmm. by showing like, Oh, this is how, this is reality. These are these people that can't 
fight very well anymore when they kick they fall down and you're actually having the actors do it a lot of the time too Um, was it difficult for them at times to fake an injury or fake (laughs) not being skilled like what is that what is that translation process like for a trained martial artist I don't know. I mean, I, they seem to do really well. They really embrace it. And I think I was also, they're getting old, they're old as well. Like Ron was like, you know, I think we had a meeting about like the type of spills that we were talking, expecting him to do. And we're like, no, 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 we're not expecting you to like do crazy falls. He's like, oh, okay. So I think even in them, like they kind of like, it was a welcome relief that they weren't being asked to do like Tony jaw type of stuff. Right. And that's just, not, that was never the expectation. Uh, so they that brought a lot of stuff to them as a character. As, and that's what I was talking about the doubling importance of a double knowing you know what your actor is capable of because these guys did their own stunts and in a lot of ways i don't think we could ever found a double that could have done what they did because they were performing the parts versus doing the choreography do you know what i mean like that kind of difference of 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 you just moving your body and it was okay if it was sloppy and stuff like that that's what we wanted and so even even elaine was improving there's a bit where he kind of faces off against philip in the pool and he hikes his pants up and then he like squares off like that was an improv that elaine had come up with it and that was like something that was real for him and something that was i'm sure he was feeling so i mean those are all things that come up as character moments that kind of tell that tell that moment yeah it's cool when you look at movement today versus when you looked at movement 20 years ago or when you look at action scenes today versus 20 years ago uh how has your perception changed I think we're at a really crazy moment right now, especially now you have face replacements and body. It's just like such a, it's almost like I don't understand it because you, I, the bag of tricks that I've developed is how you work around like these limitations. But now like it's just taking the top off and a lot of these things are a lot more possible now, which I think is like exciting, but also frightening at the same time because I just don't, I just, just I'm just gonna have to learn and figure out what, what all this means. Um, I think we're, I don't know if I answered your question, but I'll just kind of riff on it. But I mean, it's just like, I think we're at a moment where we're still in this world of like really realism and just like this tough, gritty type of action, which is great. And I think it's it's good, but I, I just feel like we're starting to go down this this road a little bit too much. Whereas I, I think there's a lot of form of action that could be fun and, and stuff like that. Even like Stephen Chow hasn't been doing stuff in the last, 10 years and this type of stuff that he was doing with action was a lot of fun too so it's like we just have we've kind of missed that kind of you know bigger slapstick or operatic things that you know now everything's kind of like really dark and gritty and and it's just really it's a little you know monotonous to a point yeah i think that that's probably one of the reasons rrr has done so well because it's so i haven't seen that i gotta watch it yeah uh, i haven't either but yeah um, I haven't had three hours to sit down and watch it, but I've seen the scenes and it's it's clearly very fun and it's clearly yeah. very, very exciting. And it is missing that or it is it is showing that, you know, there is a yearning <laughs> for this yeah. fun. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I keep I always keep an eye out, too, for like Korean action films that are fun. Oh, yeah. Korean action. When, yeah. Whenever they're fun, especially then it's like, OK, like The Veteran or City of Violence. I just anytime a, a fun action movie comes around. Have you seen any recently that you I think the thing is like with all of those actions, it's it's expensive to pull off like that type of look of RRR. Like I've just seen the trailers like those are really hard looks to pull off where you do the gritty like you can do it in a low budget fashion Mm -hmm. do you know what i mean so i don't know if the economics is an influence around all that but i mean it's it's all you know maybe that's what kind of where we're at maybe we just need to make a spoof yeah (laughs) i mean i mean it's it's right for it everybody's everybody's right for for a little satire yeah uh I appreciate the answer you gave. I actually meant you as a viewer yourself, like through your eyes, do you see it differently than you did 20 years ago? Oh, okay. Um, I totally agree with what you said, but I want to hear your perspective. (laughs) Yeah, I think I, I think I'm a little bit more simpler. Like I'm just trying to, if I can't track the story, if I don't really know what's happening, I, I get out of it. It pulls me out. If I go back and sit down, I can watch and appreciate the technical elements. But if you're talking to me in the moments, like actually watching it, it if I react very quickly if the story is not working for me and I just get pulled out. Vice versa, if I get pulled in, then it's great. It's like really like I'm a, I'm I'm like on the edge of my seat. So that's what I'm really looking for versus kind of the technical appreciation of things. I can, you know, you I can study scenes 
later. You know what I mean? So like, there's, it's just not a, a quality that I really chase as much. Whereas before, you know, I'd be really into the cuts. How do they do this cut? How do they do that? And like, really kind of like get into that versus what, what was happening story-wise. Now I'm kind of on the other side of that spectrum. Anything in particular that you, that you appreciate now that maybe 20 years ago you didn't? Um, trying to think. I'm actually, you know, what, you know, all these movies are back on Blu-ray or starting to be on Blu-ray and restored, right? I didn't, I don't think I gave a lot of shrift to like the post handover section of Hong Kong films, but now I'm watching it again and we're like, oh, there's some really good stuff here. Like, I think there was some really interesting themes and it's just, maybe I didn't really, I was like, so Hong Kong diehard and like, this is not the movies that I grew up watching. Like, these are different, you know, now that kind of watching it again, I can appreciate a lot more. There's a lot of things that I didn't really appreciate at the time. You know? yeah. I actually don't know that subgenre of Hong Kong film very well. Is that like, were they using much more symbolic forms of filmmaking to kind of like tell the same stories that they were telling before, but under a new leadership? Like, what is it about those films that you appreciate? Well, I think it was just the period of like all of Jackie and Samuel. They were like leaving Hong Kong and they were making stuff in the States. That was oh, like those films. That's what you're that's Yeah, what you're yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. gotcha. I, I thought you meant in Hong Kong. All the yeah, well, all the above. I mean, all the stuff like you could even say like Crouching Tiger, Ang Lee going to Taiwan or going to China to film. Like, there's all this really cross current type of stuff that was like, okay, yeah. I mean, it's just like you start to watch it again, you really appreciate what they do. Because if any, if anything, I think Crouching Tiger at that time, you know, I wasn't really super into it because they're like, okay, this is just like what we've seen before. Like, but Americans love it, you know. So maybe I was like doing a little gatekeeping myself. I was like, you know, this is not Hong Kong. But you look at it and you're like, this is really well polished. It's really well done. Like it's shot in a way. And it's just, he, he was going for something that was, wasn't what I was expecting or wanting. Mm. And now you start to appreciate now, you know, years later, you appreciate what that he was going for. So it's, it's interesting because that, that period, I call that the spillover period because all the Hong Kong filmmakers came to the States yeah, and uh, Corey included. Yeah. And, um, and I think that that was such an inspirational time for me because it was like, okay, these films that I love now are mainstream in the United States. And so if I just keep working at this craft, then someday like my skills will be marketable. Whereas, you know, before I was like the, the American B film, I had no interest in making those oh, films, yeah. Yeah, I know, see that. but, mm-hmm. but, uh, but like, as this kind of like, you know, <laughs> rural kid from, yeah. you know, near Oregon uh, seeing my, you know, my favorites kind of movies come out like that, that action style come out in the matrix Yeah, was like, okay, yeah. like this is a new era. Um, and uh, you saw a path for yourself. For yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. And I mean, the, the, the hard reality came when the Bourne style started becoming much more popular um, with producers mm-hmm. and it seemed like audiences wanted it. I'm not quite sure how I still don't quite understand how to read that action style. Cause we still have it. Like people still do that action style. Yeah. Um, I mean, what was your perception of the, the born style? Cause that came out in O2. At the time I thought it was really interesting. I think it's also come, it comes in waves, right? You know, I think trends kind of come and go. And I think that's the, the challenge, but also the curse of trying to chase, you know, what's happening in the moment. Um, I thought it was like something different because I think we were getting to see, you say spillover, but also we were starting to see like a little oversaturation of what Hong Kong movies were going to look like in a Hollywood form. Like you started seeing, it was great seeing Jackie Chan do us, but they also, you had your, your daredevils and you had kind of like Charlie's angels, which was like a little funky, you know, I would almost say a little kitschy at the same time. Like it was a weird, like, you know, it's Hong Kong. Now we're just going to put everybody in wires and it was just very, the musketeer, right? Remember that one? Oh yeah. 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 So yeah, that is such a, that one I totally forgot about that one. But yeah, I mean, it's just the, these weird, like, yeah, let's just throw it in because it's a trend. So I think the tastes were feeling like this very precise type of wire, pristine things was like, they want to see something messy. And I think that's what kind of Bourne came in and gave a little different, different element. And it was, it was, it was fresh at that time for sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just kind of like all those things that, that was kind of a, uh, I'm just, I'm trying to, th- if we're following, and then like, obviously Ong Bak and Tony Jaa was like this whole other, whole other thing that was happening. So it almost felt like the Hong Kongs were kind of like getting away from what made them great. And then they were doing this thing. And then Tony Jaa was like 
to me, Tony Jaa was also, you know, I, I kind of tease about Ong Bak, but Tony Jaa was like the open the door that it didn't have to be Chinese anymore. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it, like now you have all these students of Hong Kong cinema that were all scattered around the world, whether it be South Korea or, or Thailand or US or Vietnam or whatever, like it didn't have to be Chinese anymore yeah. about what action is. And I think that was really, really open the door as well. Yeah, uh, that's a, that's a really, uh, really interesting observation. Um, you're also the first person I think I've talked to that gives a fair reading of the born style. Um, because now that I watch it, um, I, I also think it's more interesting now because I hated it when it first came out because I was so gung ho. I was so yeah. gung ho. And I, and I didn't think it was interesting at all. I thought yeah. that they were like, I felt like they were defiling the temple. Like yeah. you're sacrificing a pig in the temple. What are you doing? And, and now I look at it and I go like, okay, well, hold on. Like, like you said, people might've gotten a little bit tired out of like the daredevil. <laughs> I forgot <laughs> about that movie. Um, and I, I don't know, man, that was also a difficult time in America for a lot of people. You know, the mass media was uh, um, kicking into full gear with terrorism and the war in Iraq. It was kind of a crazy time for a lot of Americans. So there might've been some kind of, maybe it, maybe it kind of like lined up a little bit better than Charlie's Angels did at the time for the average person. Whether or not the mass media was correct, like it yeah. might've just lined up in general with the perception of what was going on in the country at the time. Um, I just well, okay. but let me drill down on Bourne because it's sure. like, I know you love uh, Legend of the Wolf. Is that right? I, best film of all time. But yeah, <laughs> I so I, yeah. yeah, I saw your essay, which is great. So I, lo- I like, that's the type of, I feel like that stylistically is, they're all cousins of each other. Mm. Mm. I don't know. I would say not <laughs> because, well, no, I, I'll, I'll, but I'll, I'll yeah. counter that with, I'm, I still want to steal man Bourne properly because i think i think legend of the wolf is like a true wuxia film where the shots are very deliberate uh the editing has a cadence to it and there's like and there's a, the music yeah. is such a like part of the edit yeah uh, but the born the... <laughs> no maybe, maybe i agree with you hold on maybe i agree because the born style shaky you... cam I mean, that's the word that came out of that we yeah that. and like a shaky cam was you look at the raid. The raid got shakier camera than any film that's come out in the past thirty years. Yeah. So it's like it's not shaky cam. It's not the close angles, right? Yeah. Like I did a breakdown of writing wrongs, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and like broke down this the sequence. It's like Hong Kong films are not shot wide with no shaky cam. No, 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 no. Yeah. Um, yeah. but I think with Born and maybe the thing that it shares with Wuxia, and maybe there's some inspiration there with these editors where they're it's not it's that montage style where they're, they're trying to find moments. And you show yeah. a moment just long enough and you like, it's just long enough to kind of give the audience an idea of what's happening and like make them bridge two thoughts together. Right. And yeah. they're trying to figure out what's happening. Yeah. And I think at the time I hated that because I didn't, I didn't want the audience to work hard when they watched my films. Like, a, like yeah, there's a place for that. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. well, I think it was also maybe, I don't know. This is all ra- random musings, but you know, when when the marketing came out for Jackie Chan, it's like no no stuntman, no fear, right? Like it was just really big about like he doesn't have a stuntman. Look at these wide frames. You're seeing him do the thing. And then that becomes kind of the thing that we're expecting to see out of action. Like that's going to be a thing. And if it's not wide and I don't see the actors doing the action, then it's not good action, right? But, you know, if you're talking about like, you know, the stuff of The Legend of the Wolf or Born or, I, you know, for me, like what Sama was doing in the 90s was really interesting like thunderbolt i think is really it gets a lot of like flack but i really love the fights in that like just stylistically what he was doing it was for framing and i don't i don't care if he was doubled to hell but like this stuff yeah. the way it was created is like that's as montage as 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 surrealistic as you can get and i thought that was really fun might have uh, even been a product of having to use a double no 100 100 yeah so it's so all those things but it, like those to me it's like it kind of took the definition of what action was like you say it's not just have to be this boom presentational style it's also getting in it that's also a form of action anyways this is just the i'm not defending born i don't think born is like the greatest film ever made but i think it, what it did at the moment was like it was really it was something really different and people yeah. responded to it yeah no i think it's a very fair assessment um yeah. it's uh it's, it's not as good as legend of the wolf but <laughs> i did i just said they're like cousins far away cousins fourth cousins maybe do you have any musings on key differences between the way Americans think about movement, martial arts, fight scenes versus how like Chinese 
filmmakers and or Vietnamese in your case think about because this is so much overlap. I don't know if it's down to the country, but I think MMA is has shaped how we look at action and what we think is convincing or not. That's you know that's as as pure reference points I think for anyone, and you know people kind of see that and they judge. You know, well that's not what we see the workout in real life. And some people I either go with it and they're like, it's a movie and they love it. And other people get really nitpicky. So I don't know what that dividing line is, but I think for sure MMA has given a whole library of fight references and fight movement that we perceive to be real, you know, and that's, that's become the benchmark. And if it doesn't look like that, then, you know, we're going to check and go, Oh, this is the fantasy at this point, which I don't know. I mean, that's, yeah, I think that's probably the more, more influential of anything it's just like even seeing youtube youtube fights or something like stuff like real fights and then you're actually seeing what it actually looked like versus a movie right it's it's shaping how we see things yeah i was, I was gonna i was gonna say that too you were talking about you know clips of clips of people getting hurt <laughs> when yeah. uh when you know uh looking at um you know references for paper tigers it does seem very new doesn't it because i think the closest that we could get to that when we were kids was you find some vhs of like faces of death or something but now (laughs) yeah exactly yeah just being curated for certain reasons but it's like now there's almost like no curation needed if you want to find a stabbing on the streets like you can just find one it's really easy to do that yeah Um, and if it's not on youtube it's definitely somewhere else do you think that the perception of real violence on YouTube and it look like it's been happening since the Vietnam War, right? Like we've been watching this stuff on the news. Like, do you think that that makes them expect more violent action? Do you think that makes them want to escape? And like, where do you like, what do, what do you want to bring to that? Is, the, uh, is Power Rangers making our kids more violent? Theme? Yes. Let's violent? talk about, let's go back to the ESRB 1993. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Joe Lieberman holding up the, <laughs> the lethal enforcer's gun yeah yeah i think all of it i mean all of it could be at play i think the question is whether we examine what we're feeling that's kind of like what is more more needed or more to be able to kind of like give words to what we're feeling i think you know we're going to watch what we watch and we, we either gravitate some for some people they it's quite purgative to see something violent and so it's like okay so that's that that's my corner of my life and now i go on with my regular or other people see it as kind of like they feed off of it and so I don't know if there's a one size fits all type of thing, but it's an interesting thing. I'm always struck. This is, I don't this could be a tangent, but I was struck by when 9-11 happened. You know, a lot of people who were there at Ground Zero, they were like, they had said like it felt like a movie, right? And I just always found that an interesting comment because if it was like it was almost like this associative, disassociative fugue thing, like you're trying to make sense of this crazy thing that's happened in front of you, and it could only be a movie. And I just thought that it was just just such an interesting touch point of how people react to, you know, something as terrible as that, uh, but it's also a way of coping. Right. And so I think violence also has a place of where we see stuff and we don't, we've seen it almost in a, in a simulation form. And so when we see it in real life, we don't shut down or like react in a way that just, we can't cope or we just like, we can survive through it. So I think stories as, as a whole is also a survival mechanism a survival tools how we see things and how we see violence how we see heroes act and how we see villains act i think these are all kind of lessons of how we kind of like learn how to behave this is all learned behavior in a sense and so i think it's also important that we like i said that we examine how it feels so i'm not like really you know hammer down like violence that's like uh, unadulterated violence but you know is there what's the purpose and what's the reasoning i think that's more Hmm. more significant of what the work that you and I do and what we should think, you know, think about uh, versus like, is it good for the kids? Like, I think that's a superficial thing. It's more about like, what is like being portrayed here and why? I think this is the beat of the conversation. Oh, here we go. (laughs) Like talking real violence and and where like media intersects with it without, without the crummy nineties debate. I think that debate is stupid. I'm sorry. Um, Although there are some people who think it's not stupid. Uh, Yeah. Do you think, um, or let's say you just see real violence on the news, whatever it might be. What's your process for pro- for processing it? How else do I describe it? You know what I mean? Like, like do you go to a shrink or do you do you like like what do you do? Oh, you just bottle it up and you just push it deep down until that's you... it. That's, that's what you do, and you see what happens. <laughs> <Yeah>. Travis Bickle <laughs> comes out. Just he just comes out. And... Oh no! 
I guess my way of coping is analyzing, right? Because also like I'm interested in martial arts and self-defense and you, you know, think about, you know, if, if you see an act of violence on, on the internet, you're thinking, you know, well, what happened? What's the context of the story? You're trying to understand how they got to the situation in the first place versus the technique A and B you see that they should have done. You start thinking about situationally, all those things. And the story, I'm trying to build a story. And I think that's how I cope. It's just trying to rationalize, and understand intention and what led up to that moment, you know, all those things. So I don't know if it's a coping, I don't know if it helps, but it just helps me. Yeah, see, I use the word. Yeah, it does help me. It helps me kind of understand what I'm looking at versus just kind of like being shock and horror all the time. Cause I don't know if that's a good state to be in all the time. If you're just constantly, you know, reacting to every terrible thing you see online and just emotionally reacting, which is healthy. Cause if you shut that off completely, I don't think that's healthy either, but I think you also want to be able to find a way. It's like, well, I'm watching this. I can complain about why is the media showing this? Why is this on my feed? Why is those things? But the other takeaway is like, well, what can this teach me in this moment? And just try to figure out, you know, if I'm ever, unfortunately ever, never ever caught in a similar situation how would i react you know and that's that's kind of like the way i look at it do you think being an action director because you direct you direct action um has that helped you with this in what way like therapy to to process no and i mean just like you have a perspective you have you have designed violence yeah in in a fun way um and you've done it from the ground up where you've written the story then you've choreographed it with your team and you've shot it edited it released it tested it um read the reviews so you understand it from this very, well, you understand that violence from a very kind of like bedrock level, right? Because yeah. you built it from the bottom up. Does that help you in perceiving real world violence today? I don't know what it is because I think real world war and violence is a whole nother thing. Like it's a, it's a whole, that's a primal, if anything, like I make dreams. <laughs> Those are nightmares, right? That's, I don't, I don't know if uh, it does, but just for me, I, I, I've never really connected the two in a way yeah i mean i read stories and figure out like try to be inspired and like okay could this be a movie but not in a not in a um what's the word exploitative way but you're trying to figure out like oh this is like an interesting conflict of humans here that's happening and you try to figure out if this could be a story worth worth exploring because you said that what you're always trying to do is understand the story and the context not many people are going to take the time to be uncomfortable and go into the story of something so like is that something that you I can just, sit with it. Yeah, I feel like I can sit with it longer. I, you know, I, I have my limits too. But you know, I can sit and investigate the whys and, the, and where people might be repulsed and and turn away. Like, but I have, you know, I'm I'm a hobbyist. Like, I don't, I'm not a I don't work in a coroner. I'm not a medical. Like, I've never like I don't work with violence on that day to day. I'm not a bouncer. You know, there's those people who are like are on a different different wavelength in 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 the world for sure. Like, I'm just here reading stories and. And just figuring out what what might be interesting. So I, you know, I, I understand where I am in this mm. levels and realms of, of connection to violence. Like I'm I'm here studying it just as as an internet kid, <laughs> just you know, studying it from that point of view. But I don't live it. Like my my life is relatively peaceful, and I don't I don't it's live. Good. It. Yeah, it's good. But you know, there are people who are are those people, and they're built very differently. You know, they you know people who work around death and violence and like those those people are those people are their heroes tip my hat to them yeah I, I wonder sometimes like who who is better at reporting about the realities of violence is it the people that live it and are are doing it all like prison inmates right prison inmates talking about like how violence works right yeah and they're totally they're almost totally detached like they just mm-hmm. explain it scientifically but there's no emotional weight like there's no moral to it right yeah. Yeah. and on the other side you have victims who have very real stories but they but like maybe they're in such trauma over it that like they can't even comprehend the why because if they were to comprehend the why that means they're no longer a victim in a sense i could possibly you know in their mind it might detract from their victim status mm-hmm. um and i just i don't know i'm i'm just spitballing right now but that yeah. you know, I, I live in a pretty like dangerous part of town and when you when you're around it so much it becomes like more difficult to talk about it yeah because like how do you even turn it into words if it's something that you just do it's like how why would you even explain it in words you you react you react in a certain way so sometimes maybe like not being in it what i'm trying to say is that not necessarily being in it might actually free you 
to actually analyze it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's also maybe the shift is is worth looking at because I maybe it's not about violence, but it's about power and how power is used and wielded and you know built and stored and 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 hoarded and and uh, you know used as a sledgehammer all those things it's really about power and then you know these are kind of pulling back to even more primal stuff about where we are as human beings i think that's that's the interesting stuff but i mean all the stuff about violence and and victims and and detachment like i think that's that's above my pay grade i don't know i you know i have to think about that a little bit more because all right now i didn't mean to (laughs) way to bring it down i'll go i'll go i'll go deep no, 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 but it, like you said, like I've never really gave him thought in terms of connecting the work I do because I, you know, it is make believe. Uh, so it's like I have never really connected it to how it is mm. in that real world. All right, on a, uh, I want to <laughs> recommend, I want to recommend something real quick before I forget. Yeah. So you know Hiroyuki Sonata, the Japanese actor, yeah. he did a jazz film in 1999. Have you ever seen this? No, I'll send you the link. It's on YouTube. I haven't watched it yet, but I'm gonna I'm gonna watch it at some point because I'm writing a musical right now. Right on. Uh, and uh, I'll send you that because I think you might you might get a kick out of it because he plays a he's a trumpetist. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. You might appreciate it. I don't know. What are you watching these days? Let's just end on that. What am I watching? <laughs> uh, there's a show on FX Hulu called Reservation Dogs. I'm really loving that one. I'm watching a lot of old Blu-rays. I'm just trying to rediscover these films now in high def. It's it's kind of crazy because you're. I think you had pulled out some of the analysis where you can like see the wires and see the mats. Now it's just, everything is just so restored and so clean, which is like, I think is also the charm of it as well. I think it's all like, Hey, they were just doing it just like us. It's great. <laughs> um, yeah. The old, old blue re- restorations of Hong Kong movies is, is kind of like this little deep dive I'm doing. Um, is there anything like... about that that you appreciate in particular now, 20 years into this or 25 years in? I appreciate like that. They, they didn't let that get in the way of what they wanted to do. You know what I mean? It's like, like they're okay, you have a wire and you have a mat that's, you know, clearly there, but the gag is so cool that they just wanted to do it. Like, it's like, that to me is that Hong Kong or that entrepreneurial spirit of even Wong Kar Wai, right? I was, I was watching Chungking Express over the weekend and like, you know, they're shooting stuff out in the, out in the streets and, you know, pedestrians and people and onlookers, they're all spiking the camera and they're standing there watching Tony Lung talk to Fei Wong. And it's like, he didn't care. He just went with it. It's like, those are things I think the practicality and the the um, the no nonsenseness of of Asian or Hong Kong filmmakers, I think, is still really inspiring because I think we now everything's so clean, and we get into this digital restoration, these cleanups, and every like we want to make everything perfect and wipe everything. But there's something really nice about just like embracing what's there and just kind of shooting the film or to, doing that shot or that gag that and just do it. There was something about how Ching Garlock would fall. He would make a shape with his body. And there seemed to be this very like it, it's it borders on ugliness of this shape when guys are falling in Hong Kong films, yeah. where you think like that guy's gonna die. Yeah. And yeah. it and it's like 10 years earlier, that shape was like the crane, right? Or like the, uh-huh. the mantis or something, right? It wasn't the fall, but then in the 80s, like that fall became this shape. And like now you can see it very clearly with these restorations too, which I love. And you can even <laughs> see the face of the guy doing it, you know? Ragdoll, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it kind of became like, I don't know. I think that that was the language that was so appealing to me. When I first saw Police Story, it was like the one that really got me. Yeah. It was like how how like ugly in a sense, it's almost Baroque at times, mm-hmm. the way the bodies would fall. And um, yeah. And it's also, yeah, you start to see real bodies move in nature like that. Whereas like you have a CG flop or a CG, you know, it's like, it never feels, yeah, there's, exactly. you know, it's just, you can never have that because your limb, who would expect your limb to break and bend <laughs> that way if but real life? It's one of those things where you like, you would never know it unless you actually saw it in real life. Like those, those, those kind of like crazier than movie stories that you hear that actually happen. And if you were put in a movie, an audience would just go like, that's BS, like that would never happen. And I think that's kind of like, at least that tapping into of what Hong Kong movies for me is, it's just, it's just so real. There's no, there's no blurred lines about it. It is what, what you see is exactly what you get. And I think that's what is so powerful about it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think those movies are going anywhere. (laughs) I think they're going to be like, they're going to be like, you know, Keaton and Lloyd and. Oh yeah. 
yeah. they kind of have a special place, man. And Tony Jaw like, kind of brought that kind of shape as well, yeah. you know, that realism where, and it's not like he was the first one in Thailand to do it, but it was like just right at that time where yeah. MMA was really taken off and maybe it made sense suddenly around the world. But it's also like, like there's, um, I think going back to you asked, you know, if I look at action differently, there's also the sense of that you can't really step in that same river twice. Do you know what I mean? Like that's beautiful and powerful. And that's in that period of time. But, you know, the task for you and me is how do we create work that's makes sense for us now? You, I know, I, you know, I was never really into the perfect restoration. Like let's do copy. Like, you know, there, there's some, I think for, for folks who are learning action filmmaking, some people really got into that, like just really, really trying to copy it, which is really important because you have to learn how the pieces, you have to learn the notes, right? But then when you get like really just too religious about like doing exactly as Hong Kong style and uh, 80s Hong Kong or 90s style, like is it an homage now? Or is like, what's, I guess, you know, what's, what's the point of it? And so for me, just from, I I watch it and I think it's fun. Like I want to distinguish as a viewer, I think it's fun to watch. But for me, like it wasn't stuff that I really wanted to spend time dwelling on. Because I just wanted to be able to create and figure out what what made sense for for us now. Can't wait to see what you do next, man. <laughs> I can't wait to either. I would like to see a hundred pages written. I just right now the blank page is is cursing me. <laughs> I like doing these because I get to know my uh, my friends a little bit better too. Have we seen a fight like that? A movie fight where there's caution about what the other guy, even though everybody's empty handed, but there's caution about what the other guy might pull or draw from. Like that suspense. That to me is a suspense story right there. Yeah. Um because everybody just kind of gets into it. It's either like they fight and they draw a weapon, and then now it's a weapon fight. But like the fear of like, whoa, their partner, like, what do you got? Like, like, like mm. I've never seen any. That'd mm. be interesting. No, because it's always this like stupid device where they're fighting and then like some guy's had enough and he pulls a knife out. It's like yeah, that, right. should been, that should have been a variable at the beginning of the fight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know? yeah. You know, I was like, hey, I got a knife, man. He's like, I don't care. And then it's like, hey, well, maybe I care, right? And that can kind of factor in. I mean, that's what I'm interested in. It's like not just we talk about convention, but like kind of opening up the assumptions that we've always been making about fights and stuff like that. That's always interesting, too. It's like that's a whole beat in itself. If you made a whole meal of it, I mean, that could be that's a whole something. Yeah, that'd be fun. Yeah, like the, the opening 30 minutes of uh, Inglorious Bastards, right? Yes, right? That's great. I mean, you can yeah, you can do a lot with the threat of violence. Yeah. And then all of the dialogue like under that now has like a different color. <laughs> it's like, yeah, but you're still going to kill these people, right? Yeah. Like no matter what you say, right? Um, that's, that's actually why I started to appreciate um, Chambara style action more. Oh, oh my God. Yeah. What was the ending? The ending of Sun Sun's Girl? Yeah, like that's that's as per that's as perfect an end fight as you can have it. It's exactly. so good. That's it. Yeah, Beautiful. exactly, exactly. And I think that there's this kind of beauty in um, you know, the build up to the fight where a lot, you know, there's a lot of trying to talk talk their way out of it. Like, let's handle this some other way. Let's not do this. Um, and that's the gunslinger fight also. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it sort of like implies that somebody's gonna die if we don't do if we don't stop this with language then somebody's gonna die and we don't want that and that's what the gun you know the the gunslinger fight and the uh, samurai fight have in common yeah maybe that's why they're shot similarly you know mm -hmm. um except for the close-ups on the eyes like it's kind of an american and italian thing but i think i appreciate that more now um Whereas when I was a Hong Kong film nut, I was like, well, why is this fight so simple? Why is it only two or three moves? But so much of the choreography is that anticipation and the fear. It also had a messy quality too. We were talking about the messy mm -hmm. quality for Paper Tigers. If you look at a lot of the chamber, like it had like when they were just wheeling the swords and just whacking, like there was, it had like some of those sloppy moments that they, they wanted and it worked. So yeah, it looked, it looked very stream of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And that's cool. I mean- Makes you feel like you're there. I think the other thing to really talk about these fights and fight designs, I'm just curious to know actually what the schedules were. Like how much time do they actually make? Like that's that whole other half of the conversation that we we gloss over, but like how much time, because also time is money yeah. and how much also commitment of what the studio thinks this these fight scenes are worth. Yeah. And I think that shapes a lot of like how, how they deliver, how they create and design action. I don't know if you had this moment. It was like my biggest 
like surprise going from like guerrilla filmmaking to like real filmmaking it was like oh we have to light this <laughs> i was like oh we have, like oh and then like oh my god what this whole thing like i never realized it i was like that's how dumb i was or whatever like but then you start to realize like oh my god like this is a whole nother yeah part of the game you have to figure out and understand and and optimize right yeah you can like there is no quicker way to be to make an enemy than telling a dp that we don't have time to light it <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah or not to worry about it don't worry yeah. about it. like you will make an enemy out of that guy uh, yeah 100 <laughs> percent. like working uh on the indian films what was that process? That guy, like? was, that guy was a gem. Yeah, I was doing I was doing the end fight, and um, I was action directing. And when you action direct in India, it means the director gets to go take a break for those days. Yep. He was there, but I was kind of running stuff. And yep. so we we're shooting a one on one fight, and the weather had gotten to the point where they decided they would put up this man. It must have been like seventy foot wide, like maybe like fifty foot wide um, white bounce, right? Like a tarp. 50 by 50 or so huge took cranes to put it up there and everything they hung it on a building and so i'm telling the telling the uh the dp like okay first shot is going to be on this side because i've already kind of like got we've got the fight previs we know what we're doing right first shot was like over you know over this guy's shoulders fight 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 cut eight moves are done I'm like cool got it in the can what's the next shot and i go like all right we got to go over here now and get this side to pick up the next part of the sequence and he goes okay and he goes and he whistles and he does this and the entire thing starts coming down and they break down the entire set. They break down all the equipment. It takes like hours and they move it all. And the whole crew moves <laughs> to the other side and they move it and they rebuild it. They put that tarp back uh -huh. up and like two or three hours goes by and I'm going. Oh, and then he's like, okay, actually we shoot it. He's like, and we get it in the can, you know, two minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. What's the next shot? And I was like, we gotta go back <laughs> and he goes okay whistles they all do it again and i was just like okay hold on we have to shoot shots one three five seven nine five. we gotta do all those yeah, here yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> makeup and everything reset yeah. it all and so i re i reshot listed so that oh I could, like otherwise it was gonna if they would have oh, but they would have let us do it you'd still be filming Right now, we would still be filming to this day. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. That film would be in process right now. Oh, yeah. So I ended up like shot listing everything. And sometimes we'd shoot in reverse order. <laughs> to, like, so we didn't yeah, have to reset yeah. makeup, you know, <laughs> yeah. just pull makeup off as we get like lower on the shot list. Yep. I mean, talking about schedule and time, like that's like the, uh, the hidden aspect, you know, yeah. when we talk about action, how it was designed and stuff like that. It was kind of like what you were talking about the, uh, the writing wrongs thing about you know whether Samo or Corey and it happens all the time because it's just like schedule or whatever budget or whatever it's not like again it's that preciousness about auteur yeah that we are but they're like whatever okay you can do this in the two weeks that they're here and like they just they bang it out yeah I was actually pretty surprised because he was Corey was showing me all the stuff that he goes directed on like Choi Hawk stuff and I was like oh my god and you're like and you see it and you're like oh yeah I see his camera work and you're like they're so loose about that stuff which is cool. Again, it's just very, very commercial, but you appreciate it. Yeah. It did kind of reveal that they have this very similar like rhythm of editing mm -hmm. and uh, Meng Hoi and those guys, like the way that they would shoot and edit fights is kind of very similar. Jackie's like really the odd one out. Yes, he, he is. Very yeah. odd. <laughs> you know, I think it was, but it goes to the, I think he's, he wanted to show him do it. So it informed the way he was going to frame it. Yeah. I think also because he was, well, I don't know. Some of, I don't know. Yeah, I'm just curious evolutionarily how that came about. Because yeah, you're right. He's he's this outlier stylistically too. I yeah, I wonder. I mean, yeah, stylistically. I mean, look at his kung fu movies. I mean, he he directed, you know, Young Master, and that was like the only kung fu movie he ever did. Because Dragon Lord ain't a kung fu movie. That's about a guy who can't fight, which is great. It's one of my favorite Jackie Chan movies. Yeah. And he like never really directed another kung fu movie again, except you know. Um, Drunken Master 2. But like that, there was that style. Like Yumo Ping did it, Corey Yoon did it. All those guys had that same sort of like, you know, opening statement is this long. And then you kind of go in and then you do these bup, 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 and then an impact or yeah. like some interesting move for Yumo Ping or a big wire gag or something. Yeah. And then we go back and bam, 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 and he kind of, yeah, maybe he's just, maybe he's just always been kind of an outsider. 
it's kind of interesting hearing stories of him working under Samo, Jackie. Yeah. Because, you know, Samo's a big brother. And when, when Jackie's doing a Samo movie, it's like, the, it's like a different Jackie, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Wheels on Meals and Heart of Dragon. Yeah. It's like a different Jackie. Yeah. Different editing style and everything. Different emphasis. Mm-hmm. And I think Samo really wanted him to to fight like 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 a big boy, right? Yeah, yeah. I think that's what Samo wanted Jackie to do all the time. I think Jackie was like, "I'm, done, I'm so done with that shit." <laughs> but he would do it. I wonder if they were just working so much that like they just go into that mold. Like, okay, it's like I don't know if you get this relief. Like, oh, someone's directing today, or someone's okay. Thank God, <laughs> it's not me today. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like it's like I think he just like. Since he trusts Samo or whatever, he'll, he'll just do it. But I'm, I'm sure he was shooting another film at the same time. So it was just yeah. like, yeah, there's like all those things that were great. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Just if, when we look at it a little bit more, like from the practical view of like how they were making these films concurrently, simultaneously, all the things. Like I think it all, it all starts to make sense. Yeah. In a lot. All right, Bao. Cool. This has been an Action Talks interview with Bao Tran. Please subscribe to my channel. Make sure you check out our website at superalloyinteractive.com. Check out my personal website at ericjacobus.com and my telegram at t.me slash ericjacobus. Thanks.